Very good. Um, is there anyone that uh, council members wish to us keep us in our thoughts during our moment of meditation? Council member Wood and Spitzley. Uh, thank you, uh, President Spadafor. Uh, we did remember um, uh, Kelly Rothman McKinney um, at a previous council meeting. She has been diagnosed with stage four bladder cancer. And uh, if we could please keep her in our prayers as she goes through this fight at this particular time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council member Spitzley. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'd like to keep um, in our prayers the family of Maxine Rice. Um, she uh, died last week. Maxine, you know, and the Rice's own Rice's restaurant for years and years and years in the Logan Shopping Center. And, you know, it's one of, it's like one of those um, long standing families. They were small business owners and they contributed so much to, you know, the culture of the South End of Lansing. Um, and she had fallen and, you know, went to a, a nursing home, but, and they brought her home last week and she finally died. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, a piece of history passes when those type of, um, when those type of deaths occur. Um, and so if we would keep her family in our thoughts and prayers, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Councilmember Spitzley. Um, Councilmember Hussein. Yes, I would ask that we keep the Thornhill family uh, in our thoughts. Um, and in our prayers, Josh Thornhill, who was a graduate of Lansing Eastern uh, High School, he was a you know football standout at Michigan State, and really just an all-around uh, amazing guy, as well as uh, his wife Katie Jo. Uh, they lost their youngest son Marcus uh, this past Saturday. Uh, he had been di diagnosed back in 2018 with uh, brain cancer, and I think many of us via via Facebook, because they no longer live near, but um, watched kind of the ups and downs of that battle, the emotional toll I think it took on their family. Um, and it was just simply heartbreaking uh, to to get the news this past Saturday that um, he had in fact passed. So I would just ask that uh, we keep um, Josh, Katie, Joe, uh, Marcus, Marcus's uh, two siblings, as well as the entire extended uh, Thornhill family in our thoughts and prayers tonight. Thank you, Councilmember Hussein. Councilmember Dunbar. Thank you. I um, I would just like to keep um, Emily, my best friend, who many of you know, Emily. Even Dorfin folks um, thoughts because she has been on the front line as an ally in BLM at many different functions. Um, and she was run down. Um, and I believe that they've identified the folks on the bike, but I mean, she was literally run down while folks were painting BLM on the Capitol. Um, and there were two motorcycles that hit her. She went fly and hit her head, was in the hospital, it was a mess. Um, and it's, it's ridiculous that it's happening in this city, but I, I really hope folks will think twice um, before attacking folks like that, because she is in a lot of pain. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Okay, so we have um, this evening keeping Maxine Rice, Kelly Ross McKinney, the Thornhill family, and Emily, uh, Emily is, is how you identified her, so I won't, I won't give out her last name. Um, but if you all could please join me in a moment of meditation. Thank you. And I will uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Clerk. Uh, we have for your approval the printed council proceedings of May 18th and June 8th. Vice President Hussein. I would move the printed council proceedings of May 18th and June 8th as presented. Thank you. The motion has been made. Would the clerk please call the uh, Would the clerk please call the roll? On uh, On uh, approval of the minutes, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. 
Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. AEA zero nays. The uh, proceedings are approved, and we are to the consideration of late items. Uh, Vice President Hussein will need a motion to suspend Council Rule Number Nine. Sure, I would move for the suspension of Council Rule Number Nine to consider uh, a resolution that is essentially pre-approving uh, of a number of law firms as outside legal counsel to the City and the Lansing Board of Water and Light. I don't know, uh, President Spadafore, if you want um, Mr. Smirka to speak to the changes now or later, but I would I would move the uh, suspension of Rule Nine. We'll, we'll do later, but I just want to clarify too there. Uh, we do have a second late item, which will be the resolution establishing the fees for the North Capitol ramp as it was pared out of the budget sure. amendment. Thank you. All right, so we will address those at the appropriate time, but for now we'll need to suspend rule okay. nine. So um, without further discussion, um, would the clerk please call the roll on the suspension of rule nine. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. No. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Seven yeas, one nay. The uh, motion to suspend the rules is adopted. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, that takes us to um, comments by council members and the city clerk. Sure. Are, is there any council members that wish to make comments this evening? Please raise your hand. Council member Garza. All right. Thank you. Thank you, council president. I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to everybody that came out over this Father's Day weekend to help beautify the South Cedar Street corridor. Uh, we planted flowers, painted, and cleaned up the trash in that area. And also want to give a big thanks to Lansing Gardens. Brian Stiles from Lansing Gardens is the second year. He's donated the flowers to, uh, uh, to that project. There's nine planters. Uh, we had approximately, I think, 10 uh, flats of flowers that we planted. So thank you and uh, support your local business. Thank you, Councilmember Garza. Councilmember Wood? Um, thank you. I do see that we do have the Chief of Police on here as well. I know a number of us have been receiving complaints about fireworks. Um, and in fact, I received um, several emails today saying that they wanted it brought up at the council meeting. Um, we, as much as I've tried to explain, um, the state is responsible for the licensing of um, our fireworks, uh, the retailers. And even though um, we have uh, an ordinance that has to mirror um, the state ordinance unless we allow them to um, ignite on um, more days than what the state allows for. Um, that this is a civil infraction and um, that part of a civil infraction is that either the police department needs to um, see the uh, person ignite the fireworks or um, that the person complaining needs to either witness that and be willing to testify um, with that. Um, I know that there were concerns um, with the 911 center, um, even though people are calling the non-emergency number that's still going to the 911 center and some of the responses that they are getting from the 911 center. I was wondering if the mayor the mayor, if the chief could um, just briefly talk about um, the fireworks issue at this time. I think uh, council member, uh, Chief Green here, yeah. just to talk a little bit about fireworks. You're absolutely right. The, it is a civil infraction. The officers either have to observe it. If we do not observe it, we can take a report to the city attorney's office and we would need to uh, put in that report a witness statement uh, directly observing that. It's, so we're taking it very seriously. Uh, I've filled it, no, personally, probably about 20 different fireworks complaints. Uh, it's unfortunate that we have businesses that sell uh, those type of fireworks in the city. It complicates things, obviously, for our police department to, to be able to track down specifically where they're coming from. 
They're all over the city, they're rampant. There is not a policy, uh, whereas we give a warning uh, initially. Uh, if we see a person lighting the fireworks, uh, we will try to resolve it immediately with a citation. Uh, that's not mandatory. The officer still can use some type of discretion, but it's no policy that says that we have to supply them with a warning, but we uh, best be able to explain that in a, in a court that we either observed it or we had a situation where a witness came forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Council Member Wood. Are you all set? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jackson. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight a positive event that happened last week, Friday, Saturday. It was the Lansing School District Class of 2020 Open House that was hosted and sponsored by the Village Lansing. So I went there with my kids. It was a lot of family activities. It truly honored all of the graduates who came. Students came in their cap and gowns and was able to get treated and honored like they should. They had free pictures there that they took with their families in their cap and gowns with us with the capital in the background. They had food, pizza, sweets, all that stuff uh, ready and there the whole time. DJ Rodney Page is amazing for those who have never seen him. It, it was my first time, but he plays the violin with contemporary music. He's truly talented. And at a time like this, when things are, you know, not always on the brightest side, I just wanted to highlight the village Lansing doing great work during a time in need. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Councilmember uh, Vice President Hussein. Where'd you go? All right, I think I at least got the audio figured out. Um, yeah, so just very quickly, we, we are tentatively set to uh, resume our in-person third ward constituent contact meetings uh, September 12th at 10 a.m. That would be at the Alfreda Schmidt Southside Community Center, of course. That is dependent upon, you know, where we find ourselves uh, in the fight against COVID and, and, you know, obviously we need to, um, as we get closer, make determinations about, uh, you know, whether or not that site will, would even be open for such a meeting. Uh, we will, uh, as we get closer to that meeting date, continue to provide updates. In the meantime, I have been sending out emails with updates on Southwest Lansing issues, uh, citywide issues, regional issues. If you would like to um, get those emails, uh, feel free to um, email me, sorry, at adam.hussein at lansingmi.gov, and I'll make sure to add you to the list. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Hussein. Um, I have a few announcements to make. Um, as far as the reopening plan for um, the city council offices, um, we have been uh, given clearance to uh, reopen. I know the mayor probably addressing these comments, but I know that you're opening to the public on July is that still accurate? I'll just look for a nod from the mayor or a head shake. Uh, yes, that's the plan. It's not official and it's not finalized. So it, that is the initial plan right now. Well, that's our plan too. Um, so we are planning to move um, our staff is back in the office full time now, uh, with the exception of their work share days. And so uh, Sherry and Renee are both working on the 10th floor. Um, get, ramping up for the public to return on potentially the 6th of July. Um, if that does change, we will alter our schedule as well. Um, as far as uh, city council meetings, uh, the governor has extended, uh, Carol, I can already anticipate your, your glare. So just let me finish before I get that death stare. Um, the governor has extended the allowance for the Open Meetings Act to be satisfied through virtual presence, um, but we are going to give it a go uh, for in-person meetings. Um, what we're going to do is uh, the council member, I'm sorry, uh, Sherry, who oftentimes feels like the ninth council member, she's very uh, helpful, but she has uh, set up this, the chambers so that the seating uh, for the audience is uh, blocked off to allow for uh, social distancing. Um, the city hall, the council seats have been altered with uh, plexiglass um, in between us. We've moved the city attorney and the city clerk off the dais to side tables and the mayor and staff down to the well to accommodate um, distancing and, and fitting the eight of us at the table, as well as um, committees will resume um, if the chair wants to in the um, chambers. We'll use the well for those as uh, also. 
And then you can still meet virtually on committee if you decide to do so until the 31st. Um, we have our rule is still suspended. We, we will unsuspend it once the executive order disallows it. We're working on public comment. Obviously, the 10th floor is not a very um, large crowd friendly space. Um, so if we get more than probably 15 to 20 folks in the audience, we'll be, we'll be presented with some challenges um, in terms of spacing and public access. So I'm talking to different city departments about potential alternative venues for city council to take our, our meetings. Um, so potential places would be SWAC in the big auditorium or down at the Hill, um, the Hill Center in their auditorium or the Alfreda Schmidt um, Community Center at the auditorium there, same space, just different names depending on which organization you're talking to. So we're, we're working on it. The biggest barrier to those offsite locations is the ability to broadcast live. So we'll have to work through some of those issues. Um, the city attorney is working on, um, or has given me some guidance rather on how we could potentially satisfy the public comment requirements through virtual presence for the public. Um, but we are still trying to default to um, in-person meetings if we can. So I know that's a lot to kind of, kind of work with, but we're, we're uh, we've got three weeks to figure it out, and I hope to have a plan for you within the next um, 10 to 14 days that will finalize how we're going to do this. Um, because we have 119 people participating in today's meeting. Um, if we get anything more than about 15 members of the public into the um, audience, we're going to have to, we'll have to either limit their participation to, you know, the lobby and then taking cards and numbers and moving upstairs and downstairs as has been done in the past or try to find an alternative venue. So we're working on that. Um, so bear with me as we work through hopefully a once in a lifetime situation. Um, and then the last thing I wanna do is I do wanna congratulate the Lansing School District Class of 2020. Uh, Councilmember Jackson, you mentioned the, um, the party that was thrown, but I, I just wanna commend the district um, on the ceremony that they were able to do. Um, I, I don't know if anyone caught some of the video, but it was a very cool setup. They had a stage on um, Kalamazoo Street there and allowed parents to drive by as their child walked to the stage and got their picture taken with the superintendent, the principal and others. And then uh, formal pictures were taken. They picked them up in their car and they drove home. So it was, it was a very, um, you know, make lemons out of lem or lemonade out of lemon situation. And I think they did a great job recognizing the class of 2020 in this very unique uh, circumstance. So congratulations um, to our three high schools on their successful graduation ceremony. That does it for me, so I'll move it on to uh, City Clerk Swope. Um, thank you, President Spadafore. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, we do have about 16,000 absentee ballots that will be hitting the mail uh, on Thursday, so voters should expect to see them in their mailbox starting probably on Saturday. Uh, there's still plenty of time for those of you who wish to apply for an absentee ballot to get that application in. And again, an application has been sent to every registered voter uh, here in the city of Lansing. Um, we, uh, my office is open to the public at this point uh, by appointment for passports, uh, notary services, and other um, items in city hall uh, business licenses. Uh, we do have an appointment system at Lansing my.gov slash clerk where you can make that appointment and then um, starting um, Thursday which is 40 days before the election uh, we will be open for walk-in absentee voting um, if a voter comes in and, and we are are not requiring an appointment for that so both City Hall as well as our location at 2500 South Washington will be open uh, for that uh, on the days that City Hall is not generally open to the public, which is currently mostly on Fridays, uh, our City Hall office will be closed to the public as well, uh, but our South Washington location will be open. Uh, and while we are open, um, I, I do encourage folks to vote, uh, by, uh, vote at home instead. Uh, if they're able to, we have drop boxes so you can uh, leave your application there with no postage. You can take a picture of your application and email it to us. Lots of ways to get that turned in. Um, but for those who, who feel the need to come in person, uh, we, we will have that available. We are also, uh, for the first time um, in a number of years, going to uh, be accommodating uh, 
the voters with disabilities, uh, the ADA accessible machines that we have had in the precincts for a number of years. We will actually have those at our uh, absentee ballot locations for voters who need that assistance, uh, still have the right to vote absentee uh, so they can use that machine and vote independently uh, regardless of uh, ability to read, write, or various other um, uh, disabilities that a voter may have. Uh, and with that, uh, we are to community event announcements. If there's anyone with a community event, if you could raise your hand with star nine on a phone, option Y on a Mac, alt Y on Windows PC, or open your participant screen and use the raise hand. Uh, we'll give you up to one minute to uh, announce your event. We have uh, one hand raised so far. It's identified as Michael Lynn Jr., but last time it was Erica, so I'm just going to say someone in the Lynn household has a community event they'd like to announce. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Black Lives Matter will be having a rally and protest this Saturday, or excuse me, this Monday coming up. Um, in order to get more people out and obviously still ask the same question of Andy Shore to resign and also give our demands. Um, starts at 11 o'clock until 7. There'll be speakers, guest speakers there, um, other community activities. So that's this Monday coming up. Black Lives Matter. Andy resign. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Uh, next up, we have uh, Sam Klon. I apologize. All right, there we go. Um, hi there. Uh, I am the director of Lansing Area Mutual Aid. It is a nonprofit, and with a lot of people still experiencing unemployment and food insecurity, we are having a uh, food distribution campaign that is set for this Saturday, the 27th in the afternoon. Um, if you would like to help deliver food, uh, if you would like to be the recipient of food, please send me an email at lansingmutualaid at outlook.com. Thank you. And that, that's it. Yeah. And I see Councilmember Dunbar um, is, has her hand up as well. Yeah, you know, I totally forgot, and Kathy Toby would be on my case for not saying it. Um, the South Lansing Farmers Market is open, and um, it's every Thursday from three to seven at St. Casmer. Um, yes, the. For those who are wondering, the church is closing. Um, we are tentatively staying for the market through this season. So um, that is available. There's double up food bucks, EBT, the whole nine yards. And it was so busy this past Thursday when we held it for the first time this year, everybody sold out. So I'd say get there early if you would like to see some produce this Thursday. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Dunbar. Uh, next, I have Madalena Swan. Madalena, uh, Madalena Swan, you have one minute. Oops, you're not mute. You're, you're, uh, there you okay. go. My name is actually Alexander Balderas. Um, I have, for the people we fight, we stand, we the free people of Lansing. Uh, come meet us at Ferris Park every day or every Friday starting at 4 p.m free food, and community building. This is in honor of the original Black Panther Party for self-defense and their breakfast program we bring to you, Feed the City. All power to the people. Thank you very much for the name confusion. All right, um, I am gonna, uh, just before we get started, we are gonna have public comment this evening and everyone will be given their three minutes as usual. Um, we have had very good luck without any disturbances and things like that, but I've had this meeting, I've had a couple folks turn on their video and audio. Um, I will turn off your video and mute you. Um, if it happens to happen uh, twice, I will implement the council rules allowing me to deal with disturbances. Um, but please be respectful of everyone's time, um, and we will certainly give everyone their time to speak. Um, thank you very much. Council, uh, Mr. Clerk. So we are to the time for people to now raise your hand if you wish to uh, speak during public comment on legislative matters. And again, this portion of public comment coming up uh, will be on the resolutions for action uh, that are on the agenda, including uh, the two late items, um, 
as well as the ordinance for adoption dealing with uh, the Porter Senior Apartments. So uh, again, this is limited public comment, three minutes on action items the council will be acting on tonight. Uh, so go ahead and uh, raise your hand. And uh, while you are doing that, uh, we will go to the mayor's comments. Uh, point of information or point of inquiry, I guess, Mr. Swope. Um, I was just wondering if there was a place where the agenda was made available. I would like people to make sure that their comments are legislative or not. Uh, we do have the agenda available at lansingmi.gov slash, actually on the front, I believe it's on the front page of the um, city website, um, but it is posted on the city website and we do email that out every, uh, every week to several hundred people. Um, but it is posted on the city website. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, a few, uh, one, I guess, event, which is fun to say for the first time in a while. Um, on July 8th, we will be having our first concert in the park. Um, it's going to be socially distanced. Uh, as of now, only 100 people are allowed, so our parks department is going to work with that. Um, but if that is increased, then they'll, they'll increase the numbers allowed. Uh, it's going to be at Elmhurst, um, and it's a concert called Showdown. It's a um, cover band. Um, so again, appropriate distancing, but July 8th. Um, for all those, uh, um, especially council members, I think a memo went out today. Um, with July 4th being over the weekend, uh, the city is actually closed the, the Friday before. Um, so because we're doing a, a one day a week work share, uh, our employees will be on work share on, July, on, um, on that Thursday. So Friday the 3rd will be a state or a city holiday and Thursday the 2nd will be designated the work share day for the four employees participating in the work share. Um, you already mentioned that we're shooting for July 6th to open City Hall to the public. Um, it's not finalized yet uh, and we need to, um, to work out a few details. Uh, we expect some things will be a little different in City Hall with people coming in and being able to, in essence, um, contact the department so they can come down and meet with, um, with the, the residents. Um, we're, we're hoping not to have public walking through the building as much as we can because um, we're trying to, to keep um, distancing and, and uh, um, other things. So we're, we're working on that to finalize it. Um, and finally, uh, I'm sure many know uh, I put out a, a racial justice and equity action steps plan. I'm going to work with city council as we listen together and, and take actions for our community. The, um, the police board of commissioners have already scheduled their police use of force town halls as per the Obama pledge that, that, uh, that I took on behalf of the city. Uh, the diversity and inclusion council is scheduling town hall listening session and we'll also be planning a participatory budget meeting for public safety sometime soon. Um, so we've got many of these events coming up and uh, we'll get the information out as soon as they're all finalized, although the Police Board of Commissioners one already is um, for the review of the use of force policy. And, uh, and I look forward to hearing from everyone in our community at these, um, at these events. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Clark. You're muted, sir. Thank you. And we are to. Oh, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Clark. Councilmember Wood, your hand is up. Is that for the mayor? Yes, it is. Um, you did mention the Board of Police Commissioners um, meetings that are going to happen. I know that in the press release, it talked about the fact that uh, they were only going to allow 15 participants to make public comment. Um, could someone either you or the city attorney address that since this is an open meetings um, situation. I, I'm wondering where we get away with limiting the number of participants. Uh, I, I will let the city attorney discuss that. I don't know if he discussed it with the police board of commissioners. I know they're planning to meet weekly um, for several weeks, um, but I, I can have the city attorney address that. Uh, I don't know if he spoke with, um, with Drew Macon or not. I have not spoken with them yet. Uh, there are some issues with that, and uh, we will go over the Open Meetings Act and its requirements. Uh, that I heard about that for the first time today. 
Thank you, Councilmember Wood. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I guess I'm gonna um, express concern in advance of that. And I know that Mr. Smirka has already said there's some issues with that. I just, it certainly flies in the face of having open communications if you're gonna limit the number of people who are going to be able to provide public comment. And so I would strongly urge both the city attorney and the mayor to um, make sure that um, the public is a, the public is able to provide comments and not limited it to a particular number. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Spitzley, and I think I see Councilmember Dunbar here. You do. So, um, when these meetings are being held, is that fifteen limit based on space? in a physical meeting space? Because I would, I would hope that even though we're going back to having physical meetings, that this would be open in a Zoom fashion where numbers of people can participate like they have here and give comment remotely without having to be in a physical space. So- And, and I, saw the, I saw the announcement too, um, and I'm, I'm gonna just let them know they can use, we have a Zoom license for city council that allows up to 500 people. So I'll share that with the police board of commissioners I'll happily transfer that away from me, and then Mr. Smirka can can put the hammer down on the law part of it. Mr. Smirka, uh, <clears throat> that's why I refrain from commenting directly until I have all the facts. I mean, if this is a full board of police commission, which is a public body, uh, there has to be full participation. If it's not a formal police commission meeting, if it's some type of ad hoc committee that has no policy. It's a different rule. Um, you can have physical presence, you, but there has to be access either through Zoom or some other electronics so everyone has full participation. I will talk with the chair to see exactly what was intended. Uh, sometimes you read into press releases and there are a lot, there's a lot more to it. And so, yes, there, are, there is an open meeting requirement that has to allow for participation. Um, Councilmember Hussein. Yeah, just real quick. I think the uh, press release, I think it was explicitly clear that this is, this is a Zoom meeting. Um, this will not be an in-person meeting. It is a meeting of the full board of police commissioners. Uh, and so I agree with uh, the sentiments raised here that um, it's incredibly alarming that they would only allow for 15 people to, to participate uh, in terms of the public commentary piece. So uh, we appreciate Mr. Smirk, any uh, work you can do to, to straighten this out. <clears throat> All right. We haven't heard from Councilmember Betts or Garza, but I assume they both agree on this issue. And Councilmember Jackson, excellent. All right, we're going to move on to um, public comment. Mr. Clark. Okay, our first speaker on agenda items. And again, if anyone wants to see the agenda, it's on the front page of this um, city website, lansingmi.com. Um, and the first speaker tonight. This is Ricky Figueroa from California Commercial Investment. Um, prior to tonight's meeting, I requested the council table of vote uh, related to a pilot extension for Porter Apartments. I just wanted to give a little uh, background and understanding as to why I did this. Um, over the last month, we had been debating internally about how to host quote unquote non-essential individuals at our properties um, given COVID. As you know, our residents at Porter and uh, our properties nationwide are elderly and at very high risk of contamination at this time. So um, portfolio wide, we've had great success in keeping our COVID related cases um, to a very small number and none at Porter. Um, but that success is due to very strict restrictions on people entering the property. So a couple of weeks ago, um, once we got a better understanding of the council's process, um, we tried to reach out to council member Hussein specifically to start having um, council members visit the property. We didn't realize though at that time that we would be back to full council so quickly. 
So um, we would like the council to hold the vote on the pilot ordinance to allow more time for us to host more council members at Porter. We want you to see the property firsthand and get a better understanding of our project um, and also give you an opportunity to meet our management staff. Um, we just want to provide you with a, you know, and demonstrate greater transparency, um, which I believe is a concern for some members. Um, we have multiple full time employees at Porter. Um, including site staff and corporate management staff. Um, although a little less present due to COVID, generally they are very present at the property. And if you're open to visiting, they are happy to welcome you um, and give you a tour um, and maybe grant you a greater picture of our management style. Um, if the vote is tabled, um, which I hope uh, it will be, we, I will follow up um, to coordinate individual or small group visits as soon as you're available. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next, I uh, have Dustin Hunt. Unmute yourself and you have three minutes. I don't see a Dustin Hunt, Mr. Clerk. With his hand up, with their hand up. All right, uh, he must have lowered his hand then, uh, Sam Klom. Um, my conversation is non-legislative. I'd like to be moved to general comment. Thank okay, you. You can go ahead and raise your hand when we, when we get to that portion again. Um, next is Susan Cancro. Susan, you're on mute, go ahead. Okay, I, you don't need video, I assume. Nope. Okay, I um, am commenting tonight just about the um, piece of, uh, not a, a legislative matter, but the um, substantial amendment to the contract for the ESG and CDBG money that's coming from HUD. And the reason I'm commenting is just that I understand that that final decision, that vote or approval of the resolution that we can send to HUD has been put off for several weeks. And the concern we have in the network of agencies working with homelessness is that some of the money that would be coming from HUD, which would be delayed by the delay of that approval, is for uh, rapid rehousing and prevention. And right now we're expecting quite an onslaught of people who are going to go through addiction in addition to the folks that we serve every day who are homeless and that number of homeless has not gone down we are trying to get those folks housed but that money that's coming in would pay for what we've already done and as you know um, Advent House Ministries which I represent as the director and the network of shelters had made sure that our homeless oh, yeah. folks were safe through this process so I just ask that the council consider moving that along if at all possible. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense for what you are looking at today. I understand that there wouldn't be a vote today or a, an approval, but I really need to encourage you to please move that forward. Um, other places have already approved it and it's taking weeks to get that funding to come in. The longer we wait, the longer it will be before we see that money and our people need that help. We are planning to be available as people are getting eviction notices. We are planning to be available to pay for rent, to pay possibly for mortgage payments. We have a variety of funds out there, but we need that HUD funding to come in as soon as possible. I don't know if you have any questions for me, but I'd be happy to help you if you need to understand what's in that amendment, but it should be something that would be familiar considering you've approved the plan prior to this uh, substantial amendment. Thank you, Ms. Cancro. The council does not typically respond to public comment. Thank you for your comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next speaker is identified as we the free people of Lansing, and if you would like to more specifically uh, identify yourself, please do so, and you have three minutes.
And uh, you're going to have to unmute yourself there. Oh, you had it. <laughs> All right, there you go. All right, are we on? Yes. Yeah, you're on. Okay, so let's go over here, guys. So currently, currently we are, we are, just in case for anybody who doesn't know, we are those protesters that have been showing up to Andy's house. We paid him a visit this morning. Um, the ones that have been blocking off the streets and everything. Um, uh, the ones who also have been being demonized for defending ourselves. Um, we have, we have, uh, we have been said that we are pulling guns on unarmed civilians, bullying them on the streets. And um, they leave out the part where those people roll up to us with motorcycles and rev them and threaten to drive through the crowd. Um, so um, I feel like if we didn't protect ourselves, we might get hit like Emily got hit. We have been targeted, circled and surrounded and bullied. And uh, I feel like this is all part of the, the, the larger agenda to continue to overfund the uh, underworked police department and, and uh, continue to take funds and revenue from things that are actually needed in the community. And because we're actually, because see, when we got out in the streets and when we went to Mayor Andy Shore's house, within two days, $100,000 was pulled from the police budget which is something that people have been trying to get done for a long time. And so because of that, you know, people want us to stop. And I just want to take this time to say to those who are in positions of power that until these things that we have demanded are met, we're going to keep going. Uh, I was told that Andy Shore couldn't visit with us because of some ongoing criminal investigations that have not been made known to any of us. Today, we decided to take our protest to the sidewalk. Um, and and uh, in doing so, we relieved the police department so they're not using all the squat cars to follow us. And we've been interacting with the community more. And uh, uh, we want to take that money that's being given to the police to buy them like their new 2020 Ford Explorer is a $50,000 truck. That's $50,000 that could have gone into education, or $50,000 that could have gone into, into one of these community programs to help people. So we want that to end. We're going to continue pushing to defund the police, and we're going to continue to push to Andy Zor resign. So that's all we want to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Amanda Thomas-Shaw. Thank you. Um, it's actually Thomas Show. And um, I just wanted to take a few minutes today to talk about also defunding the police. Um, I looked at some legislative actions and it looks like we are thinking about it in this city, but I just wanted to um, explain how important it is to um, survivors of sexual assault as well as domestic violence that we stop putting so much money into police and we start putting money into resources and education and services for survivors. Um, I think that not only, um, it's, it's very clear that the police and prosecutors and the criminal legal industry, they have one bottom line, which is you know money in for the city. Um, and that's a good way to get that money is by putting people in jail. and. I think that it's time for us to reimagine a world without violence, um, a world where we do not continue to treat violence with more violence, which is um, mass incarceration. I really, um, I personally have had a lot of people ask me as a survivor of sexual assault and domestic violence, what would I do if I didn't have the police? And I am here to say I would feel so much more safe. Um, the police have made my life as a survivor more difficult. I was um, harassed by one police officer who I did make a report to and then when I needed him in court a year later he did not answer his subpoena. That's one personal situation I've been through but I have seen time and time again survivors fall through the cracks 
not because there are people that are trying to catch them, but because the cracks have been left there for them to fall through. Um, I think that we, it is time for a system that prioritizes the well-being and safety of its citizens instead of punishment of people who we could actually be helping if we started putting money into things like education and community health and public safety. Um, and obviously protecting and serving by the police is not giving us any more safety. I think, I, you know, I've got 44, three, 43 more seconds, so I'm going to use this time to say I think it's time for new leadership in this area. Um, I specifically think that our current mayor, it's time for him to step down so that we can have somebody new um, light the way for our city, somebody who I can look for, look to um, as somebody who I respect and who will have my best interest in mind as well as the communities that have been historically marginalized. I am sick and tired of having this conversation over and over, but it is time to, that we put our money in prevention and not response because this, the way that we are handling things as a society is not working. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have PK and again, if you would like to uh, more fully identify yourself, uh, feel free to do so, and you have three minutes. Before we, before we continue, um, we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, if you, if you want to wish to address us on legislative matters, we are going to close the legislative matter portion of public comment, as we typically do, um, at the conclusion of the next three minutes speaker. So get your hands raised before that three minutes is up, please. And PK, I'm sorry to interrupt. Please continue, and I will start your timer now. Hello, my name is Patrick Koval. Uh, I have been involved in some of the Black Lives Matter and defund the police campaigns for Lansing. Uh, I wanted to give comment mostly because of the item on the agenda, the legislative agenda for the declaration that racism is a public health crisis. Uh, that's certainly true. And I, I think um, uh, to some extent that hasn't exactly been solved uh, otherwise as far as systemic racism and uh, in certainly healthcare uh, um, uh, disparities and, and, and what have you. But, but what actually led to this being done now is not racism per se, a certain type of racism. Uh, it's police. Police are a public health crisis. It's not just racism. It's also police. Well, that's, you know, uh, they're systemically racist. So I guess, you know, uh, it's under that category. But uh, that, that would be a, a better way of framing this. And, and it's appalling that this has to come out now uh, when it's only now it's been boiling over. Uh, we have spent much too, far too much time punishing uh, the poor, the people of color, uh, the homeless, uh, people who are using substances, who are addicted to them. Uh, and it is by far, uh, now is the time to take the money from the police and reinvest it so that uh, people like the uh, woman who was just speaking a, a moment ago about, um, about homelessness and uh, uh, um, addiction, uh, she is not strapped for cash, but it is uh, the, the, um, the police who have to make a few cuts around the corners because maybe they have to get, uh, you know, cheaper cars because, you know, who actually needs that money? Uh, the people who are on the streets, the people who desperately need treatment and can't find it because no funding is there. So the, the sort of conclusion of this is what are we going to do? Uh, are we going to continue to punish uh, the poor, the people of color of Lansing, the uh, people who are using substances and are addicted to them, or are we going to help them? Are we going to make it so they don't have to fear for their lives when they have contact with the police? Thank you. Thank you. And um, Jim Smirka has his hand up. I'm not sure if you intend that. No. He's just got, I'll put it down. Okay. All right, so we are All closed right. at pu 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 for public comment. The folks with their hands up will still get their, their three minutes, but we are, we're gonna move on after the 12 or so folks give their remarks. Okay, next we have uh, Tejmika Torak. Uh, you have three minutes. Hi everyone, my name is Tajmika Torak. I'm the founder and executive director of the Firecracker Foundation. 
Uh, I am here because I, first of all, I'd like to address our mayor and just say that I have been incredibly disappointed with your leadership in terms of the anti-racism work that we need in our community right now. And from one leader to the next, when you do harm to a community, you acknowledge the harm, you apologize, and then you take the steps to fix it. And that does not include taking photos with black people in the streets. That includes apologizing and stepping down and doing the work you need to do to fix yourself and not pretend to be doing diversity, but to step into actual anti-racism work. That takes humility and it takes leadership. And if we're moving into a season where we are naming racism as a public health crisis, then we need a leader who can take on that challenge with authentic authenticity and integrity. And I don't believe that Andy Shore is that person. And so I am definitely standing with Black Lives Matter and asking for that resignation. The other thing that I want to acknowledge is that we have this equity and anti-racism fund um, in the legislative package. And right now it's proposing 100,000 out of $7 million. So just to give context, my organization that I built from scratch has a budget of just over $350,000. That is not even a third of my budget. I really think that that is not even, that is so disrespectful, honestly, to respond to our demands for defunding the police with $100,000 out of 7 million, that is inappropriate. And when we talk about police violence, I would also encourage our city council members to expand your definition of violence to include sexual violence. Because sexual violence doesn't just happen at the hands of community members, it also happens at the hands of law enforcement. We need less police, we need more community services, we need to be invested in our communities, in our black people, because our black people actually starve for resources in this community and $100,000 is not gonna get it. So if we are actually serious about public, uh, racism as a public health crisis, that means we need to be serious about investing and in, in resolving that. And we also need a leader who is equipped to do that. Thank you. And thank you, next we have Heather Patler Holguin. Hi. Um, um, I would also like to put my input on um, Andy Shore stepping down, but I want to speak on um, what was brought up uh, with racism as a um, public health emergency. And um, you cannot address that issue if you're putting $80 million into the police and only um, a small fraction of that into public health. So one of the things I think that we should look at is putting um, this idea of the public health emergency into public safety and sharing that $80 million that goes to um, police to um, helping the disenfranchised and the people that are suffering and the children that are suffering from racism in, in the schools um, by law enforcement. So a reallocation of funds is a must if we're going to um, say that there's a public health emergency um, and actually do something about it. Um, another few things that I did want to address as well as I think that um, Mr. Shore should really do his research on what uh, defunding the police means and what it means to a community to work together to help its own. We have a, an amazing culture here in Lansing and we're really on um, a, 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 a bouncing block, so to say, to do amazing things because of the culture of Lansing, we're one of the most diverse communities in Michigan. And um, unfortunately, he is not proven to be the leader that um, can uh, lead such a diverse population. So a few things that, sorry, that should be addressed um, is uh, using what it seems like he does is using the police force and um, arrests for misdemeanors to refund the government. And that's just lazy policy. Um, I would put that to the um, city council members as well. Um, we need to take responsibility away from the police 
Um, they're not mental health consultants. They're not trauma informed. We need to put professionals in these positions. Um, and that's all. Thank you. And thank you. And the next speaker is Madeline Swan. Yeah, sorry, I didn't. I didn't need to say anything at the moment. My apologies. No worries. Thanks. All I have, to, all I do have to say in regards to the the city of Lansing is, um, Mayor Shore, we would like you to resign, and that's about resign. All I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Michael Lynn Jr. Hello, I'm I'm kind of going to be speaking in the same room of the uh, declaration of the public health crisis. Um, or saying that uh, racism is a public health crisis. I think that if it's in a public health emergency, the first thing we gotta do is get rid of Andy Shore. But I'm gonna explain why. And I'm also gonna call uh, city council to take some action here. Um, given the fact that he won't resign and step down so we can move our city forward as far as racism goes, I want the city council to pull a full investigation into the wrongdoings and racism inside of his office especially but also the misuse of cards, uh, P cards that have been, uh, that Natasha Atkinson's came on America 20 to life and explained that she witnessed. Um, transparency for policing complaints. This is something that we've been asking for. Uh, I think that it goes a long way to find out who's having complaints, what type of complaints are being had and how they're being handled. Um, PR. We've noticed that over the last, uh, I don't know, two weeks or so since Andy's been on the hot seat, he's given us a whole lot of uh, PR uh, moments where he's out here walking with black folks, taking pictures, uh, candid pictures with our other state reps and our, our other uh, uh, elected officials that we've, uh, we've elevated to that level and kind of planning himself in places to be seen as somebody who is empathetic to black people. It's not working. I would like for it to stop and again, he won't. I'm imagining that he had a meeting with PR people today to discuss how he can clean up his act or at least make it look that way. So given the fact that Andy Shore won't resign, he won't take what the people are asking of him. I'm pretty sure that the protests and rallies are going to continue until he does. But also I want city council to act on behalf of the people as we elected you to do and pull a full investigation on the ongoings inside that office as it pertains to Joan Jackson Johnson, Bob Johnson, Mary Riley, Juwan Randall, Chief Randall Telefero, Chief Bruce Odom, Chief Dave Odom, and how Dave Odom became an assistant chief after making a, a complaint about racism. I want that investigated. Bishop Maxwell was in the office when it, was, when it took place. So was Colin Boyce. I need this thing investigated to the fullest because if you're out here taking racial complaints and turning them into promotions, that's illegal and you should be fired. I want a full investigation as to who allowed the gas to be put on those young people in the streets. I've heard three different things and I always throwing Chief Green under the bus. We will not have it. Um, I don't want any city money or funds being used for his PR to clean up his mess either. So I'm calling on the city council to take care of this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Kyle Holsinger Johnson. You have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, thank you. Yes, I am here um, as to share my support for the black leaders of Lansing as the white citizen of Lansing calling to defend the police. As a Lansing resident, I believe we should support our black community. The Firecracker Foundation recently published a plan to end the over-policing of black children that demonstrates why defunding the police is part of the solution. Based on the Alliance for Safety and Justice's Crime Survivors Speaks document, we know that 61% of crime victims say they prefer shorter prison sentences and more spending on rehabilitation and prevention services. By a margin of three to one, crime victims prefer holding accountable those who commit crimes by options other than prisons, such as rehabilitation, mental health treatment, 
drug treatment, community supervision, or community service. By a margin of 15 to one, victims prefer increased investments in school, schools and education over more investments in prisons and jails. By a margin of 10 to one, victims prefer increased investment in job creation over more investment in prisons and jails. By a margin of seven to one, victims prefer increased investment in mental health treatment over investments in prisons and jails. Reform is not the answer. It has not worked. Defunding the police and reallocating those funds into prevention through education services, mental health services, housing services, social services, health services, and jobs is the answer. I am here in supporting of the Black Lives Matter of Lansing and its Black leaders calling for Andy Shore to resign. Um, and Andy, what I have seen on Facebook over the last two weeks has been an embarrassment to the residents of Lansing. Your PR stunts have been disgusting. I cannot believe what I am witnessing on Facebook. Your exploitation of the Black community is irresponsible, unforgivable, and violent. You are causing harm to your Black community. You must step down. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is James Raddick. Hi there. Uh, my name is James Raddick. I live in Lansing's fourth ward. Uh, I would like to speak on the legislative matter of establishing the equity and anti-racism fund. Um, I believe that idea sounds great in practice, um, but upon looking at the press release from the office of our mayor, Andy Shore, I must say I am disappointed. I see the city council, Mayor Shore, our police chief, Daryl Green, and the Human Relations and Community Services Director, Kim Coleman, uh, made this announcement to move $170,000 of remaining dollars in the current fiscal year, which ends on June 30th, 2020, uh, about a week away. Um, that to me sounds like Oops. giving table scraps to the community. And, and I think that's uh, incredibly disappointing and insulting. Um, and I hope that the idea is not to um, put out a good amount of, of good PR in hopes of silencing the community um, because as we've heard already, the community plans to continue with this movement and, and I hope we all encourage them to do so. Uh, furthermore, I would like to say that the Lansing Police Department um, proposing to place 0.2% of their budget into that fund is also disrespectful and disappointing. And that is not what I believe this movement is asking for when they are calling to defund the police. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next we have Zach Whaley. Thank you, Mr. Swope. Um, I just wanted to share that I was present for the events that occurred Friday night uh, near the Capitol when one of the fellow um, political activists I was with was intentionally hit by a white supremacist riding a motorcycle. I've heard some people try to use this as an example of why people calling to defund the police are hypocrites. And I just wanted to provide some clarity. Um, and this is why this is actually a perfect example of why we need to defund the police. Um, specifically to the people who feel that police in their current form um, are preventing violence. LPD has been informed multiple, um, multiple times about the supremacist antagonizing demonstrators near the Capitol over the past two weeks and still have not acted in any way to address these people. These people have been driving without license plates, driving well beyond the speed limit, and using intimidation and harassment to try to elicit a response from demonstrators. None of this will be surprising to anyone who has sought accountability or justice through the criminal legal system. But even that night that the assault occurred, one of the police present directly stated to me that it wasn't their job to try to stay and prevent the crime. 
there were other things that they needed to attend to that night and that we were going to be out there finishing the painting by ourselves. The only thing that we can count on police to do is respond after harm has occurred uh, to respond with morbid curiosity, just to document the damage and move along exactly like they did Friday night. We must defund and abolish the police if we ever want to establish a community that is safe for everyone, not just white people. And it was clear to everyone present Friday night that the individuals on the motorcycles have absolutely zero fear of consequence or accountability. And they're not wrong. Even now, even after they've been identified by um, citizens and by the police, the police still have refused to arrest them or charge them uh, for this grievous assault on uh, my friend. And this is for an incident that's involving a white woman where I took over 20 pictures of the assault occurring and it occurred right below a camera filming the intersection uh, that MSP has the recordings of, um, which at least as far as earlier today, LPD still had not attained from MSP. They still were not interested. They were also not interested in acquiring the pictures for me of the incident. Um, but it just begs the question, how would this have gone down if the same thing had happened to a person of color when it wasn't so perfectly documented with 20 um, witnesses present at the same time? With that, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. And uh, next we have Kathy Hollister, who I, I accidentally uh, lowered your hand. So Kathy, you're up. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathy Hollister, I live in the First Ward and I'm also the Executive Director of the Capital Area Health Alliance. And I wanted to talk about the Racial Equity Fund. So my understanding about the fund was that um, Money was going to be moved from the current budget from three sources to fund it: 100,000 from the police department, 50,000 from human resources and community services department, and $20,000 from my brother's keeper, which is a city initiative for youth of color. So what I find confusing is why why would money be taken from my brother's keeper to to go into a racial equity and anti-racism fund? Is it that is work that is working on racial equity and anti-racism. Um, I also don't understand taking money from community services. That seems like that's something that's really important. Um, it, it is my understanding that when Mayor Shore became mayor, he stopped funding our local truth, racial healing and transformation process, which is underway here in Lansing, as well as nationwide. This is a WK Kellogg initiated process focused on bringing about transformational and sustainable change and addressing the historic and contemporary effects of racism. So our local TRH process was housed under One Love Global, is housed under One Love Global and led by the skillful hands of Angela Waters Austin. I've been part of the process for three years as my uh, role as the director of the Capital Area Health Alliance as well as personally. And it's my understanding that when uh, the process was initiated during Mayor Bonero's term, money was written in for the city to um, fund My Brother's Keeper and Girls' Equity Network, which is focused on education and enter entrepreneurship. What made her sure then cut these funds to 20,000 in the first year, and then those funds actually never made it to TRHT. So it seems to me, we already have an anti-racism equity work, great work that's going on in the community. It has been for the past three years. Let's fund that work. Let's refund it. Let's not, let's not take money from my brother's keeper um, and certainly not from community services. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have Sharla Burnett. Hello, um, my name is Charlotte Burnett. I'm a Lansing resident and I'm also the founder of Organizing Together. And one of our current projects is the Michigan Overdose Data to Action. It's a part of a CDC grant uh, in conjunction with the state of Michigan's health department. I've been working with um, individuals who have substance abuse disorders for many years um, throughout my work and it seems a common theme that we talk about a lot is the over policing of youth in our community and how it greatly impacted them at a young age, which helps lead them to being wrapped up in the criminal justice system, um, going down the path where they couldn't afford uh, to live or pay their dues 
going to jail, going back onto drugs to cope with not being able to, to re-entry, do re-entry to our community. When I look at the current uh, legislation to talk about defunding the police and about this equity and anti-racism fund, I can't help but feel disgusted. I look at where you're pulling human service, like you're pulling from human services, which is obviously what we're kind of asking for, uh, for the black community. And the police, you're only taking out 100,000. I mean, that's literally 1.4% of the police budget. That 100,000 is only 0.6% of the entire budget. Over half of our city budget is for the police, while only 11.6% is for human services. If we're punishing people in our community and we're not providing them with the tools to be able to overcome their disabilities and meet their needs, how is punitive measures going to help them? Who is that protecting? It's not protecting the community. It's upholding a system that is built to protect itself and to protect its members. So I would really like the, the mayor and the city council to think strategically about what type of city you want to build. You have an opportunity here to do something amazing, to ride a movement. And instead of taking advantage of that, you are trying to throw chump change at them. And all of that is going to do is piss off our community. So if you wonder why everyone is calling for Mayor Shore's resignation, it's because this is insulting. So please take that con into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Spencer Paranaud. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Spencer. I'm a longtime resident of Lansing, and uh, I'm calling, or I'm calling in about the uh, racial equity uh, fund that is um, coming up at a number of one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, I think, um, compared to the police budget of seven million dollars, and thinking that the police cannot even stop the fireworks. That is literally the only thing that people are consistently calling in about right now. And we would really like to have anything done about that at all would be great. Um, it is scaring my dog constantly and everyone else's dogs and any veterans in the area. And cops are saying they can't do anything about it because they can't. Like, that's, that's not part of their job. They, we, they could go and arrest everyone, but that doesn't help anything. Like, we could put that into human services. We could put that into a number of different things. Um, this is that $170,000 is, as everybody has said before me, insulting um, uh, compared to the budget of the Firecracker Foundation, which is three times as much. And they could do so much with, uh, that, with that money. Oh, my God. I, and taking $50,000 out of my brother's keeper, this is, I don't know what you're thinking. Um, this is why we are calling on it, Andy Shore, to resign. Because, like, I don't know if, like, Verge would have done this better, Andy, but you are not leading us through this crisis. As the person who said before said, we have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to step up and to do something and to make this city a beacon in the country, and you are just stepping down from that. You are just not looking that in the eye. You could do so much more. I am so unimpressed. I think you should resign. Black Lives Matter, I yield my time. Thank you, and next we have Rachel Biskins. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, thanks. Um, this is Rachel Diskin. I'm also a Lansing resident, um, and I'm here to talk about defunding the police. Um, I've been contacting my council people, and I just want to tell you that I'm not going to stop until I see a serious conversation about what defunding the police can look like here in Lansing. Um, I understand that change takes time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, I've got Oh, someone else is talking. <laughs> um, I've got some responses saying that, you know, things are in motion and um, that it's too late for this year and whatnot. I get that. Um, and it's difficult to 
make cuts in an already strapped budget. Uh, but racism is a public health emergency in our community and in our country. And I really want to see real conversations about reallocating funding to services and away from police. I'm not talking about reforming the police department. I don't really want to see any more information about how we're going to have DEI trainings and we're going to teach police officers how to de-escalate. Um, I know that you as council people and the mayor have done research on this and you know that those things don't work. Um, so it's time to talk about defunding the police and reallocating those funds to services. Um, when you're having those conversations, Council, um, you know, analyze our police calls and the type of services that they're providing to determine if they really need to be performed by police officers or not. Uh, deploying social workers, caseworkers, mediators to our community is going to help our black community and it's going to help everyone. Um, you know, there is a, a racial health crisis, but this type of work is going to help everyone in our community. It's a big conversation and we need to be strategic. Um, and I encourage you to look for best practices in other communities. Um, like a few recent people have said, we can be on the right side of this movement, but these conversations have to be had now. And saying that the budget just passed and it's time to, you know, it's too late. That's not the kind of conversation we need to be having. We need to be thinking about the future. Um, I want city council to act on behalf of our whole community and we can do better. And there is no option but to do better. Uh, so thank you and I yield my time. And thank you. And the final speaker that raised their hand before the uh, deadline that uh, was announced is Sam Klon. Is that better? Thank you. Cool. So I'd like to speak further specifically about the issue of fireworks. I have often taken issue to a lack of enforcement on it. I don't think I've seen fireworks enforced a day in my 20 years living in Lansing. Um, and it's incredibly personal for, for me. This began when I was a middle schooler on the east side. And during the fireworks on the 4th of July, I heard gunfire in between spacklings of fireworks and it killed a seven-year-old. I watched her to and from the bus stop every day. She was seven. She was emotional and she was proud and she was stubborn and sweet and beautiful. And I loved her and she died and her name was Amaya Edwards. She died, and to my dying breath, I will hold some portion of this blame on the LPD for their response time, for their inability to respond to things that are necessary. The history of distrusting fireworks has been furthered recently by occasionally being unable to tell if the bass reverb that I hear is a larger diameter tube going off or a tear gas canister. You see, Andy Shore and the police force tear gassed me and enhances my paranoia of loud noises. I was there peacefully offering medical assistance, people that cut themselves on broken glass, people that trip, people that are tear gassed. And I was collateral. Teenagers were collateral. And contrary to the statement that the LPD published the following day, I've heard no announcement that it was declared unlawful. That day, I did not hear any order to disperse. I heard no warning of tear gas, even though an officer guaranteed me that it would come. And that is especially heinous during a global respiratory pandemic. And also, it kind of violates the Geneva Convention, if any of you pretend to care about it. In essence, fireworks are a good parallel image. It's a spectacle, and it results in pain, just as police brutality. We've had every opportunity to change the police force. Mayor Shore specifically had the opportunity to consider systemic overhaul during a case that brought news uh, about 18 months ago. And Chief Yankowski resigned, and there is still an issue that is escalating. So it is not coming from the chief of police office. It is coming higher up. The police don't help me. Their behaviors in the last week have been unacceptable, and they have been PR because they tear gassed me. They didn't make Emily feel safe when she returned to a BLM event after being saved, uh, after being hit by a motorcycle. Andy, you've had numerous opportunities. My expectations are incredibly low, and I'm still somehow disappointed. I don't trust a leader who spends five figures to make a city logo that's just a copy of the school district's logo. I don't trust a leader who doesn't understand the difference between equality and equity. I don't trust a man who tear gassed teenagers without any proper legal procedure. I don't trust a man who's clinging to an office instead of finding a better place to assist people. And I assure you, Mayor Shore, that office is no longer yours. It is no longer a place where you may be effective. I don't trust him and I don't trust people who will tacitly or overtly protect him in the future. The city would be better off with a leader full of other, a, a mayor's office full of other leaders like Angela and Tashmika and Mike Linz and Mrs. Hollister's 
but we don't have that. I would trust a set of Legos in that office more than I would Thank trust you, a Thank you, And so we exponentially get Okay, thank you. We are now to council consideration of legislative matters and uh, resolutions for action. Our first one is from Council uh, President Spadafore, uh, extending the declaration of state of emergency. Yes, so um, despite the fact that things are still moving along for openings and, and all those business, all that business, um, we do have to extend our state of emergency. Uh, this one is extending it to um, July 4th. 14th, let me triple check that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the in front of me. I have the motion. Can some... Sorry, I've had like 100 documents up, but not one of them <laughs> is that. Um, just a second. It is July 14th. July 14th, okay. And the thinking behind that is our next meeting is July 13th. So if we have to extend it again, it will be on the 13th. Um, as usual, the mayor may uh, um, end the state of emergency early if necessary, but can't extend it without the council blessing here. So I'm recommending that we um, approve this resolution and I'll ask for a motion to do so. Council, oh, I'm sorry, Vice President Hussein. Uh, President Spadafore, I'd move the extension of the declaration of state of emergency regarding COVID-19. Thank you. There is a motion in front of us. Is there further discussion on this issue? Seeing none, uh, would the clerk please call the roll? Uh, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the resolution is adopted and we are to the Committee of the Whole. The first item is the Stop Violence Against Women. Yes, um, Vice President Hussein, would you care to make the motion to place this item before us? Uh, yes, I would move the grant acceptance for the Stop Violence Against Women grant from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you. As you all will recall, this is something we talked about last Last time we met, as well as at Committee of the Whole this evening, um, it is a grant for uh, $71,011 um, for a, to help fund the, um, a detective in LPD that is dedicated to domestic violence issues. Um, we had Judge Ward on Committee of the Whole to explain to us the process and the, the partnerships between the agencies, the prosecutor's office, the police department, Eve, and the uh, 54A District Court and the Domestic Violence Court and how they utilize these funds. Um, it is a newer program, uh, six months old. Um, so we did request some efficacy data through Council Member Betts, um, but that efficacy data is not yet available because of the timeline on this program. Um, and this is a grant acceptance to make the city whole on the funding we've expended for the position. So the motions before us, is there further discussion on this item? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? The resolution, Council Member Betts. No. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafore. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Seven yeas, one nay, the resolution is adopted. And that takes us to the Board of Water and Light Equity Agreement. Mr. Clerk, before we move on, Councilmember Dunbar did raise her hand. Uh, oh, Councilmember Dunbar. That's all right. You got to unmute yourself, uh, Councilmember Dunbar. Or just keep talking. One moment. Kathy, you got to unmute yourself. Oh, shoot. Am I good? I just became a Saturday Night Live meme. I know it. <laughs> um, no one's watching. Okay. That's a <laughs> Good. Um, I just wanted to explain my vote on this. And I, I was one of the ones who was hoping to, to move this to a point where we can analyze um, more efficiently our spending mechanisms and the grant applications, etc. And I wanted to thank um, Judge Ward for explaining during our Committee of the Whole, the process, the grant, the funding mechanism, the rationale behind it. Um, 
but one of the other reasons is that I'm voting for it is the money's all spent. Um, so there's not really a way that we can get it back without leaving a giant hole in our, um, our budget. But I did want to reiterate that in the future, I really think we need to be looking at survivors and, and finding out from them, is this the most effective way to spend the funding? I get it with, with Judge Ward and the new grant application. They want to see what the efficacy of this is. Um, but I, I think that we really seriously need to look at alternative methods, um, particularly in the domestic violence realm. So there's my piece. Thank you, Council Member Dunbar. Uh, moving on, Council City, Mr. Clark. Uh, we are to the Board of Water and Light Equity Agreement, Fifth Amendment. Yes, uh, Mr. Vice President, would you care for a motion to place this properly before us? Sure, sure. So this pertains to, um, as uh, Clerk Swope stated, uh, the Fifth Amendment uh, to the City of Lansing and the Board of Water and Light Equity Agreement. Uh, the original equity agreement was negotiated back in 1992. Uh, there were four amendments dated 2001, 2012, 2013, as well as 2018, respectively, um, all extending the, uh, the length of the agreement. Uh, amendment five, uh, five, sorry, as explained to us as part of Committee of the Whole, uh, would essentially extend the terms of provisions of this agreement for an additional two years, uh, whereas the payment for fiscal year 2020 uh, is set at $23,100,000. The payment for fiscal years 21 and 22 would be set at a fixed, um, let me see, $25 million, sorry. In addition, uh, for fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22, uh, the board would pay to the city of Lansing an additional uh, amount should the board's revenue from retail and wholesale sales of chilled uh, water, electric, steam, heat, and water utilities for the 12 months preceding May 31st. Um, if So again, if their revenues exceed $409,836,000, uh, uh, there would be an additional payment to the city of Lansing, and that would be 3% of that excess amount. So that would be in addition to the $25 million that we would receive uh, as part of the return on equity. Uh, this agreement would automatically terminate on June 30th, 2022, uh, unless extended by the Board of Water and Light Board of Commissioners as well as this body. So with that being said, I would move the resolution. Thank you. There is a resolution properly before us. We discussed it at Committee of the Whole, and uh, thank you, Vice President Hussein, for that detail. Um, is there any further discussion or questions on this issue? I will just note that there is a change. I, maybe you mentioned this, Vice President Hussein. We did change it from the one that was in the, co the committee packet to the one that's in front of us. There was just a slight change removing the fiscal year 20 um, kicker, as City Attorney Smirka called the the sweetener on the revenue pot there. So um, just a minor change, but that, that will, will now be reflected in the packet that's online. Okay, seeing no further discussion, Mr. Clerk, would you please call the roll? On adoption of the resolution, Council Member Betts. Sir, admitting, yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. The resolution is adopted. And we are to the uh, citizen participation plan. Vice President Hussein. Sure. So we had Don Kalhanik as well as Doris Witherspoon. Uh, from the planning department to our committee of the whole process to explain this piece. Uh, it was explained to us that citizen participation is required by HUD as an essential piece to the city's annual consolidated strategy and plan submission uh, pertaining to community development programs such as CDBG, uh, home grant programs, as, re as well as emergency solution grants. Um, in any event, um, we are looking to amend the citizen participation plan to provide for a shorter public comment time uh, for the purpose of responding to the COVID-19 crisis and to improve the readability of the citizen participation plan. As part of uh, the CARES Act, the city has received additional CDBG funds as well as ESG funds, which is uh, emergency solution grant funds. HUD uh, wanted these dollars to be uh, spent as allowing for that window of public participation uh, to be reduced to five days but is requiring that municipalities uh, actually change their participation plans uh, to reflect this, this shortened window. Uh, so the actual action plan amendments will be vetted by council on July uh, 13th. But again, this is the amendment to the participation plan to allow for that shorter uh, period. So with that being said, I would move the resolution. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, is there any further discussion on the, um, the amendment in front of us, or the resolution in front of us, excuse me? Seeing no further discussion, um, I, I will just note that um, we are going to get, you'll see on the agenda this evening, a referral for the actual substantial amendment to the plan. This includes our COVID and CDBG home and emergency solutions grants uh, funding that we'll be receiving. That'll be on the next city council agenda. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, but without any further discussion, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight days, zero nays, the resolution is adopted. And that takes us to uh, the declaration that racism is a public health crisis. Vice, um, not Vice President, um, Council Member Spitzley, would you care to make the motion and explain what will be before us? Thank you, um, Mr. President. What we have before us is a resolution introduced by um, the entire city council that um, declares um, racism as a public health crisis in the city of Lansing. This, the resolution um, dovetails in, in off of the declaration um, that racism is a um, public health crisis that was done by the Ingham County Board of Commissioners. Um, yeah. I'm just going to read just a couple of them, whereas racism is a social system with multiple dimensions, including individual racism, which is internalized and interpersonal, whereas systemic racism, which is institutional or structural, is a system of, of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on social interpretation of, of how one looks. Um, the other whereas is we're really taken from the Ingham County Board of Commissioners resolution um, and we've, we've um, adopted those um, whereas is uh, in our own. Um, but um, on the second page, it talks about the therefore be resolved that the Lansing City Council supports the EM County Board of Commissioners declaration of racism as a public health crisis in the county of England, Ingham, I keep saying England, Ingham. Further be it resolved that the Lansing City Council issues a call to action to address the root cause of racism that affects all members of our society on a local, urban, and rural, state, and national level and demands action from all levels of government and society. Um, as a result of this uh, resolution, the City of Lansing will be establishing a standing committee on equity, diversity, and inclusion to establish relevant policies that improve health in the Black and Brown communities. Um, support local, state, and federal initiatives that advance social justice, racial equity, and continue the work which began in 2013 through the city's, through city council's ad hoc committee on diversity and inclusion. And we've had a number of our council members who have um, added to this resolution, um, including adding, um, you know, uh, including um, not only our, our black residents, but our brown residents in the city of Lansing. Um, talking about um, including the mention of the city's um, ad hoc committee on diversity and inclusion. Um, be it resolved that the Committee on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion will assess our current and proposed laws, ordinances, and health regulations, and our policies, as well as their implementation to, provoke, to promote health for Black and Brown residents of the city of Lansing. Be it further resolved that the Committee on Equity and Diversity and Inclusion will assess internal policies and procedures to ensure racial equity is a core element in all organizational practices. Be it further resolved that the Committee on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, in addition to being open to the public, will report back through the Committee of the Whole on the status of its work, not less, not less than on a quarterly basis. Be it further resolved that the city of Lansing urges other governmental boards to support the Ingham County's declaration of racism as a public health crisis and to immediately take steps to inter intentionally address and support methods that will strategically reduce the long term impact of systemic racism. And be it further resolved that the city of Lansing 
the Lansing City Council requests that the Lansing City Clerk forward copies of this resolution to the governor of the state of Michigan, the Ingham County's state legislative delegation, the Michigan Association of Counties, the Michigan Municipal League, and the Capital Council of Governments. And with that, Mr. President, I move the resolution. Thank you very much. And I have the uh, copy on screen that was available for folks watching at home. It will be as part of our packet, but we did make significant changes to the draft in the Committee of the Whole, so that's why it was not in the packet this evening, as we knew that would be the case. Um, is there a discussion on this? Okay, seeing none, I want to thank Council Member Spitzley for um, helping put this together, the rest of the Council for um, reviewing it over the weekend and coming to Committee of the Whole with your, with your suggested changes and improving a good product and turning it into a great product. Um, I think each of us knows that this is a, a symbolic gesture until we start taking action and we plan to do so. I've actually already communicated with our um, clerk, I'm sorry, our office manager that we need a resolution officially establishing the committee and setting up those rules and I'll be amending committee assignments and putting folks on that committee as soon as possible to get that work started um, as part of our work as well. I think it's been announced um, before, but I've reached out to two organizations. We're trying to coordinate some time for the city council to do its own um, diversity um, uh, implicit bias training uh, specifically for governmental bodies so that we can, we can help um, make sure that our decision-making process comes from a place of understanding our biases and privileges. Um, and we'll be working on that as well as the listening sessions we talked about. So I, I just want to thank you for, for your diligent work on this and um, probably will be supporting this motion. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Yeah, adoption of the resolution. Um, Council member Betts. Yes. Council member Dunbar. Yes. Council member Garza. Yes. Council member Hussein. Yes. Council member Jackson. Yes. Council member Spadafore. Yes. Council member Spitzley. Yes. Council member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays, the resolution is adopted. Um, Next, uh, there was an item that didn't come uh, get reported from committee, so we are to the fiscal year 2020 year end uh, budget amendment. Yes, um, Council uh, Vice President Hussein, would you like to place this item before us? Sure. Um, do you want me to just real briefly discuss it? Or? Yeah, okay. if you'd like to. Uh, so, this is, I appreciate it. So, this uh, resolution, this is again the fiscal year 2020 year end amendment. Uh, this resolution amending the fiscal year 2020 budget uh, is necessary due to a myriad of factors, um, many of which were discussed today as part of our committee of the whole process and, and none more probably noteworthy than uh, decreased revenue estimates due to COVID-19 and emergency orders for folks to stay home and stay safe. Uh, that pertains obviously to our income taxes, our state revenues, charges for services, uh, fines and forfeitures and other revenues. Um, in any event, the resolution uh, includes some other pieces. Um, it does include uh, the remaining net proceeds of the Townsend ramp being contributed to um, the general fund reserves, uh, AKA the rainy day reserve. Uh, the general fund being reimbursed for expenditures uh, related to prior year lawsuits by the sewer and wastewater fund uh, reallocation um, of the uh, vacancy factor due to hiring freeze and, and some savings um, uh, related to the work share program. Uh, we did take a look uh, again at the specifics as part of our committee of the whole process as they pertain to uh, the general fund um, estimated revenues and appropriations as well as special revenue fund and uh, enterprise funds revenues uh, and ex expenditures as well as our capital uh, project fund uh, revenues. Part of the resolution, the I should say, um, Part of the initial conversation uh, did uh, center on a resolution that also included the approval of a fiscal year 21 fee change and economic development and planning uh, parking fund for North Capital Ramp from 110 to $120. That um, is now going to uh, be acted on separately. Um, so that was amended out. Um, and again, uh, there was some discussion about, uh, there were two things in our packet. Uh, one of the resolutions was dated uh, June 8th and one was dated uh, June 18th. Uh, so we did move forward um, from Committee of the Whole with the June 18th, or the, I should say the resolution that was stamped June 18th. So that being said, I would move the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, the next item, uh, not the next item, uh, we have Council Member Wood who'd like to say something. Or ask uh, you. Thank you, President uh, Spadafore. I do see that our treasurer is um, with us. 
And I'm wondering whether we could ask um, Judy, I know one of the issues that um, is part of this resolution has to do with the assessments for Downtown Inc. and the fact that those assessments um, that should have gone out in December did not go out. And according to um, the budget director indicated that this was uh, a problem that came up in the treasurer's office. So I'm wondering if Judy uh, could respond to that. Ms. Kaler, I've got um, a question from Councilmember Wood. If you're there, would you care to respond to the issue related to the DLI assessments not being issued in December? Let me find you here. There you are. Welcome to City Council, Ms. Kaler. Judy? This is a new one. She's unmuted, but I can't hear her, so. All right. Um, this, maybe she doesn't have her microphone on? Yeah, that could be something. All right, uh, Councilmember Wood. I'm not sure I'm having much luck getting the treasurer on the on the phone here on the line here. Although I hear an open mic. Judy, are you there? No. All right. Um, is there anyone else from the administration that would care to dive further on this, or? Well. Uh President Spadafore, I was, uh, since she was there, I had hoped that we could get a response from her. We did hear from other members of the administration and I had wanted some clarification from Judy, but um, in fact, I don't even see her in the list anymore. So, oh, there she is. Um, so I'm not, sh if before we vote, if she's unmuted and can, talk, I would appreciate it. If not, um, then maybe that's another discussion that we can have in the future. For those following uh, home, oh, the, there's a transfer of funds from the general fund to the downtown Lansing Inc. fund um, in the budget resolution to cover the um, fact that we did not, um, the treasurer's office did not assess the special assessment on the DLI businesses in December, so they'll have to be assessed in July, um, at which point that general fund dollars should be reimbursed uh, from DLI. Um, but obviously, uh, Ms. Kaler can speak to that more directly than I can, but. All right, uh, Council Member, we're gonna move on to Council Member Spitzley and see if we can try to raise uh, Judy before we vote on this. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I, I guess I had the same questions and concerns. I continue to be concerned about this, this, this fund transfer. I continue to be concerned, um, you know, about, you know, this, the whole thing of this, the, the assessment not being uh, mailed, the notices for the assessments not being mailed out in time. I continue to be concerned with when, um, you know, our city attorney suggested we ask if this was um, standard accounting practices that we didn't get a immediate yes, we got a roundabout response. Um, that to me raises a number of concerns about uh, this, 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 um, this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no other questions, I'm going to call for a vote on this. I'm sorry, President Spadafore. Um, yes. I just, um, Judy Kaler just sent me a text message. She's having trouble. Um, it's not that she's not wanting to respond. She's having trouble getting in. All so, right. Well, uh, perhaps um, there were enough votes to pass this through to council. So if we have the votes tonight, what I would suggest is maybe an explanation of how we got here at a committee of the whole meeting in the future um, alongside of the um, um, discussion on that issue um, in July. Okay, thank you. If we could please call the vote, Mr. Clerk. And Ms. Kaler, if we, if we do happen to hear us, we'll, we'll get you in to explain um, how this played out. 
Thank you. Okay, on uh, the year end budget amendment, Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafor. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. No. Council Member Wood. No. Six days, two nays, the resolution is adopted. And that takes us to the late resolution uh, regarding the list of outside uh, legal counsel for the city of Lansing. Yes, let me get that pulled up, sorry. Um, if we can go to the uh, resolution for the North Capitol ramp, I have that one more readily available and then we can come okay, back. Okay, sure, yep. Um, so yeah, the resolution for the North Capitol ramp uh, parking, monthly parking fee. There we go. Um, Mr. Vice President, would you care to um, sure. put this one before us? Sure. So this, yep, absolutely. This res resolution uh, pertains to a fiscal year 21 uh, fee change in the parking fund for North Capitol ramp from 110 uh, to $120. It was, it was explained to us as part of our committee of the whole process uh, that it was a simple error um, that uh, caused the, the omission of this item. Uh, the 120 does reflect the cost of providing um, parking services essentially, and it is in line with the other fee changes uh, that we approved, this body approved at the end of last month uh, as part of our uh, budget process. So with that being said, I would move the resolution. Thank you. There is a proper motion before us um, to approve the resolution changing the North Capital ramp fee from $110 to $120 effective on July 1st, 2020. Is there any further discussion on this issue? Seeing none, would the clerk please call the roll? Okay, on the uh, parking fee change, uh, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight years. The resolution. Adopted, so we can go back to the uh, attorney resolution. Yes, and I'll have um, Vice President Hussein, if you could make the motion to put the uh, approved council, the motion, the resolution approving um, outside council in front of us, I'll have the city attorney explain it. So moved. It's been moved by Vice President Hussein. Uh, Mr. Smirko, would you care to address the resolution before us? Certainly, and thank you for taking up it as, uh, this up as a late item. Uh, over the years, uh, City attorneys had brought a, pre, a list of pre-approved counsel to you for approval. Doesn't mean we have all this litigation that everyone is using these attorneys, but we have a pre-approved list. What's happened in the last couple of months is we have changed our insurance. Uh, we are now members of the Michigan Municipal Risk Management Authority. They have their attorneys that would handle the cases for the city of Lansing. Uh, that is the, uh, the personal injury, bodily, bodily injury uh, cases. We, had a, we have a couple of cases that are very significant uh, that need attention. Uh, one's a, a shooting case and one's a death case. And so going to this resolution, it was decided to, let's look at all of the firms that are on this list because some of them have gone out of business and we just needed to modify it so we took the steps to actually put on this list the uh, firms that we might use in the future I, al I also reached out to the board of water and light uh, they have uh, firms on here for their matters energy matters and so they also added to this list um, so that's basically uh, the reason for the resolution. I needed to get the one firm approved for sure for the Michigan Municipal Risk Management Authority. Are we off? You're still no, going. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, Councilmember Spitzley, thank you, Mr. City Attorney. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And so these are firms that we do business with or we anticipate doing business with that are going to provide us with legal advice. Is that is that the list? Is that what's going on here? It may be that certain litigation comes up that requires one of the firms, for example, bonding. We have uh, one of the firms here handles the bonds for us. Uh, there may be specialties for the Board of Water and Light dealing with the uh, energy matters. Uh, there are firms that deal with energy. Um, these are just, just, just pre-approved firms that can be used in the case they are, in the case they are needed. Um, in the one case I gave you was the management authority has their own firm that handles all of the municipality uh, litigation. And so they're on this list. So uh, it's just a list that we can use should, a, should one of these firms be needed. Okay, I, I get that, uh, thank you. Um, so why is Teresa Bingman on this list? Uh, there's a potential that she might be used here in the future. So I put her on there also. Doesn't mean anything's gonna happen, but that's why she's on. For litigation? No, not necessarily litigation. It can be for uh, any type of work. Contracts, uh, it could be research, could be uh, negotiation. Okay. All this right. is not exclusively litigation. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Wood. Thank you, President Spadafore. Um, Jim, since I don't have the previous resolution in front of me, could you list those that are the new ones that were added um, on here? Yeah. Oh, I'm, a, I'm on mute. No, you're good. Uh, okay. Rosati at the bottom of the first page was added. That's the MMMRA firm. Um, we already had Sam Bernstein that right. litigation. A um, couple of these are uh, Board of Water and Light that I'm not familiar with. That might be Spiegel and uh, the Spiegel firm on the second one. Uh, Teresa Bingaman is new, and uh, you know, Willingham and Cote is not new. Um, a lot of the firms were eliminated also from the prior resolutions because they either were merged or they're suing us or <laughs> they haven't done that so well. I appreciate that. I just wanted to know what new ones we had added. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so with no further discussion, um, let's uh, call the vote. Okay, on adoption of the council list. Council member Vets. Yes. Council member Dunbar. I say yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafore. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. No. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Seven yeas, one nay, the resolution is adopted. And with that, we are to the order of ordinances for passage. Uh, we have an ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan to amend the code ordinances of the City of Lansing by adding a new section in Chapter 884 for the purposes of providing for an extension of a service charge in lieu of taxes for 98 low-income elderly dwelling units in a project known as the Porter Senior Apartments pursuant to the provisions of the State Housing Development and Authority Act of 1966 as amended. Is is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the Committee on Development and Planning and is on the order of immediate passage. So uh, we do have a request from the applicant to withdraw this, but I'm gonna let Council Member Spitzley um, address this as the Chair of the Development and Planning Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. We do have a request from the applicant 
to withdraw this, um, but it came um, too late for us to take it off the committee. Um, I think we're, we were going to discuss it at Committee of the Whole this morning um, before this, but we went, we went over. Um, you know, the, the email and listening to um, Mr. Figueroa earlier, um, you know, he was saying that, um, you know, in light of COVID and, you know, he's trying to get tours of the, of the building and that council members name may need more information before they make a decision on this issue. Um, we did try to schedule a tour and I know that council member um, Hussein attended that tour. I was unable to attend. I had a previous engagement. Um, and so I wanted this kept on because I wanted to have council members weigh in on whether, you know, I don't have a problem with delaying it if, if council members are still wanting to um, gather additional information. So that's kind of why it's still on the agenda. So um, absent a motion, uh, sorry, uh, council member Betts, are you raising your hand or waving? No, sorry. Somebody stopped by and was yelling at me. Very good. Um, council yeah. member Spitzley, I guess yeah. I would entertain a motion to table it if there seems to be no strong desire to move this. Yeah, I, I, I move that we, that we table it and, and Brandon, I was yelling at you just now too in my <laughs> in my mind but I make a motion to table this um, until I, I, a, mo a month's time so we'll bring it up. yeah and at we'll that bring it back up on the 27th schedule. yeah yeah all right so the motion before us that I think I properly stalled until the clerk has returned to his chair <laughs> is to table the ordinance until the 27th of July yes and the clerk please call the roll Okay, uh, the motion to postpone Council Member Betts. Yes. Council Member Dunbar. Yes. Council Member Garza. Yes. Council Member Hussein. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Spadafor. Yes. Council Member Spitzley. Yes. Council Member Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. Um, the consideration of the ordinance will be delayed until July 27th. And that takes us to um, speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters. So uh, once again, uh, members of the public who wish to address the city council can start uh, raising their hands. Uh, we do have a couple of other items of business before we get to calling on on those folks, so. Mr. Clerk, before we move on, I've got two council members. We have members some council hand. members. <laughs> yep, so council member Spitzley, then uh, council member Wood. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we should probably explain why um, there has not been discussion on the, the um, budget amendment to establish the equity. Oh, yeah. Um, so the Committee of the Whole met at, um, hours and hours ago, five o'clock this evening, uh, to discuss what was a lot of the agenda items and the committee did not take action on that item. And in fact, we're going to push that into next fiscal year with a more robust conversation um, about the issue that, that's being um, asked of the city council and the mayor's office. Um, so we did not take action in the committee of the whole, therefore it did not make it to the council agenda this evening. Um, so even though it showed up on our agenda, that was a presumption that the committee of the whole would pass it and the committee did not pass that. So that's why, those of you who may have been uh, paying attention at home, why we did not make um, any motions on the um, budget amendment to establish the equity and anti-racism fund. Um, thank you, Council Member Spitzley for that. And then Council Member Wood. Um, President Spadafore, could we attempt one more time to see if Judy is able to um, be heard at this time before we move into the conclusion of our meeting? Yes. yes. Ms. Kaler, are you available to speak to the uh, previous issue related to um, the, um, the assessment on downtown Lansing? Council Member Spitzley, you seem to have a more direct line. So she can't get 
Okay. She's here twice, but neither one has her video or audio on. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clerk. Let's come okay. wrap the home stretch. <laughs> we are. Uh, we are to reports of city officers, boards, and commissions. Sure. Mr. Vice President. Uh, from you, I'm looking for a motion to Sorry, for all I items to, be considered. I yep, I think I'm, I, get, I got it. I move that all items be considered as being read in full and the proper referrals be made by you, uh, President Spadafore. Thank you, sir, very much. The motion before us is uh, for the for uh, considering the items read in full and for me to make referrals. Um, any, would the clerk please call the roll? On the referrals, Councilmember Betts. Yes. Councilmember Dunbar. Yes. Councilmember Garza. Yes. Councilmember Hussein. Yes. Councilmember Jackson. Yes. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Eight yeas, zero nays. Uh, the motion carries. So we have. Um, Letters from the city clerk regarding uh, the announcement of me being elected president of the Michigan Association of Municipal Clerks. Place on file and much congratulations. Yeah, congrats. Thank you. Um, we have executive orders 2020-02 and 2020-03. Place those on file, please. And letters from the mayor regarding an ordinance to modify membership of the Employees Retirement System Board of Trustees. Community the whole. Uh, installment purchase agreement, financing for fire truck and equipment. Committee on Ways and Means. Um, special assessment, snow and ice removal assessment for winter 2019-2020. Public service. Um, budget amendment to establish the equity and anti-racism fund. A little reverse order, but we'll place that in committee the whole <laughs> that file. Um, the appointment of Barbara Lawrence as a member of the Board of Fire Commissioners. Uh, public safety. And a substantial amendment to the uh, annual action plan to receive CARES Act funds for CDBG home and emergency grant solutions. Community the whole. And communications and petitions. We have a, uh, two items from the Liquor Control Commission. One is an application for Mozone's brew house for a new small winemaker license at uh, 305 Beaver Street. And the other is for the uh, Lansing Entertainment and Public Facilities Authority uh, for a new uh, license um, on, at, uh, for an SDM at Gross Bike Golf Course. Both at the general, Committee on General Services. And we have a letter from the Ingham County Clerk notification of the county resolution to declare racism as a public health crisis. Place it on file, please. Okay. We seem to have lost an item that is normally on the agenda where council members have an additional ability to comment. I'm is that a passive aggressive move on your part, Mr. Clerk? Or <laughs> just an oversight? I, I, I think it was a cut and paste error or something. <laughs> well, we will allow council members an opportunity despite the clerk's attempts to silent us. Uh, are there any further comments from council members this evening? Well, you lucked out, Mr. Clerk. Okay, and likewise, the mayor generally has another opportunity at this point in the agenda. Mr. Mayor, you, okay, I see, I see a no from the mayor. All right, so okay. we'll move on. All right, public comments. Uh, members have three minutes to discuss, or members of the public have three minutes to discuss uh, city government related matters. And the first hand I see up is Michael Lynn Jr. Before we do, Mr. Lindo, I will just remind folks you have three minutes and the council does not typically respond to public comment. And I'm gonna give folks to the end of the first two speakers to raise their hands and then we'll be closing the public comment list. Uh, Mr. Lynn, you are welcome to unmute your mic and the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, first, I wanted to point out the fact that I appreciate uh, Council Member Betts for wearing America 20 to Life t-shirt. You look really good in that, my brother. Um, and also Brian T. Jackson, Council Member Brian T. Jackson for wearing the Village Lansing. Uh, two organizations that are absolutely doing actual work in this city. Um, on top of that fact, I wanted to get back to the man, Andy Shore. 
I don't hate you. I don't think any of us do, but I really love this city. I truly love this city. You're like a st abusive stepdad that won't leave. I just want you to go, man. I want to get back to business as usual. Um, I just be wondering sometimes, do you even Lansing? Like, do you even know this town? Do you know this city that you're in? Do you have any idea how much the people that live in the city care about it? I don't have time to teach you how to stop being racist. And this is why I ask for you to resign. We're spending too much time during a racism public health crisis teaching you how to stop abusing and hurting us. Black lives matter not only when they die or when they're killed, but when they're fired or discriminated against at work. Take this serious, man. I don't hate you. I don't know you. Have no idea anything about you. I've never seen you before you were our mayor. But I love this city way more than I'll ever let you allow, allow you to disrespect this city, the people in it, hurting the people in it. I want you to know, I've watched your propaganda. I watch what you do. I've warned people about it. And every dollar you spend fixing your image, I'll spend 10 sweat equity hours to tell the truth. It won't work. You do right by us or you leave. You've already shown the propensity to double down, 10 toes down and mule up on us. Anytime somebody comes forward, Teresa Bingham cannot fix your problem. She may be able to fix the next mayor's problem, but she can't fix yours. Your PR company can't fix your problem. You walking with our black leaders can't fix your problem. You either step up to the plate, I'm excuse me, <laughs> you don't have that option anymore. You gotta step down. This is not gonna get better. We're in a situation where we can't take this anymore. We can't keep trying to teach you how to stop being racist. And when you step down, Peter Spatafor, you're gonna step up, not by choice, but by legislature or however you wanna call it. We will expect the same of you. If you mess up, I'll be at your doorstep too. I just wanna hold y'all accountable and understand we love this city more than any of you guys can ever understand. I was born at Sparrow in 1981. I've never left. I've been right here in the trenches. I've been on all levels of it, from the bottom of the hill to the top. And I know what it can look like when it's ran by the right leader. Andy, I don't hate you, but I love this city more than you. Peace. Thank you. Next is Sam Inglot. Hello, hello. <laughs> City Council. Um, let me start off by saying that I'm, I'm really happy with how the beginning of this meeting started. Uh, the, the, the talk about transparency and open government as it relates to the police commission meeting. And you all talked about the Open Meetings Act. You all talked about transparency, making sure that the public had input, things like that. That's great. Love to hear that stuff. Which brings me to my next point. Um, I'm looking here at um, the racial justice and equity community action proposals as released by Mayor Shore. The largest section actually has to deal with transparency. Um, however, I think that this push for so-called transparency is a bit hollow if we are not able as the public to access the, what should be public records of complaints against police officers of this city. Uh, in 2019, the Lansing City Pulse requested three years of complaints against police officers, as well as documentation of how those complaints were handled. Those were denied by the city, by the mayor's office. I would ask that you strongly, strongly, in the strongest terms possible, really, reconsider that move. Because right now, there is a lack of public trust with how policing in this community is being handled. The idea that the police commission meetings were going to be limited to 15 people, and now the city attorney has to look into it, that's not a great start either. And also, those police commissioners are all appointed by the mayor. So please, I would again ask the, both the mayor as well as the city council, who I believe has the power to open up those records requests, to make those public documents 
those complaints regarding the public servants that our tax dollars pay for to be made public. There are, I, I've filed plenty of FOIA requests as a former reporter, as a public policy nerd. There are ways to redact and protect people's privacy in certain circumstances. However, I do not believe that a blanket denial of three years of complaints against Lansing police officers is warranted. You all should, the mayor, the city council, reconsider that denial and allow the public to access those public documents. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you for my people in Lansing for uh, stepping up, speaking out. Black Lives Matter. Thank you. Thank you. Next Mr. Clerk, we are, we are closing the um, public comment um, window. If you haven't signed up by now, um, we will let everyone who has speak. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Sarah Williams. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, my name is Sarah Williams. I am a social worker. Uh, I live in Lansing for many years. I'm also a white woman. Um, and I am also echoing many of the previous comments around um, defunding the police and protecting black lives. Um, I wanna echo some earlier statements around um, putting money in prevention and not response. So I'm also a public health person and so many leaders at so many levels always want to throw money at problems after they happen in crises. And I feel like this is such an opportunity to um, take all this momentum and money and smart people in the community and make in incredible change. Like, I feel like this is such a moment. And Andy, I feel like you could be such, like what an opportunity to lead this city that is so passionate about these issues and what a missed opportunity because you have caused harm to this city especially to black folks and they have told you that you have caused them harm and you have not apologized there's no transparency there are pictures of you in different places whatever that means but like own it like what i'm so disappointed and and let down and angry at the leadership in this city. Um, we need to defund the police. We need to invest money into mental health services, community building, after school programs, universal health care, transportation, music, arts. And if we're using an equity lens, we're gonna that means investing more into our black communities because they are disproportionately affected by every health and education outcome. I think it is an insult to think that a hundred thousand dollars is going to do anything. I realize you need to put a policy and a something on a paper. I think that is insulting and offensive and disgusting. I think most of our city budget should be put into these preventative programs that will help improve relationships and decrease crime. I've worked in state buildings before and there are often leaders that are the biggest barrier to huge change the momentum around this movement cannot be done with Mayor Andy Shore. I stand with Black Lives Matter asking for his reg resignation and it's time for him to go. Thank you, I yield my time. And thank you. The next speaker we have is Brian Doyle. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Doyle, Lansing resident. And um, Today, uh, much like Sam was saying earlier, uh, the meeting started out great. I was happy to hear the passionate uh, voices from the city council members talking about the transparency and the public access that they wanted to see when it came to these forums with the, uh, the police that we were talking about earlier. Uh, I want the council members to keep in mind that as we transition back into some semblancy of normal and you all go back up to the 10th floor this isn't going away this number and volume of interest is going to stay with the city council until lansing makes some systematic changes in how our uh, most vulnerable residents are treated and so whatever accommodations you all need to make 
to make sure that about a hundred of us can be addressing you and seeing you um, in the council chambers. That's what we need to be thinking about going forward. Um, there are a lot of different ways and I hear people constantly going after Mayor Shore, um, which I agree that he needs to resign. Uh, he is not the man of the hour uh, to be taking glancing through this crisis. City Council members, I beg you to remember that you are in charge here. This is your city as well. Every decision that you have made over your tenure on the council has made or contributed to the health crisis that we just voted or you all just voted on tonight has contributed to that. It hasn't made it better for the Lansing residents, our black residents rather. It's led us here. And every vote that you take from here until you're out of office, I beg you to take with the frame of mind, is this going to help address the health crisis of racial inequality in the city of Lansing? Is giving this tax incentive to this developer going to help the black residents of Lansing? Is this beach along the river going to help the black residents of Lansing? That's what you need to be thinking about because you just said that there's an emergency here in Lansing. Act like it. That's all I have tonight, thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker is Ambrose Nelson. Amber Rose? Nolan. No, Nolan, thank you. Amber Rose Nolan. Here we go. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Let's move on, Mr. Clerk. Okay. Um, we'll go to Ross. Oh, I'm sorry, oh. can you hear me? Yes. 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 I do apologize. I was on the wrong screen. My uh, work does not use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I have to bring, again, reflects much of what we've already heard. Um, one thing that was brought up earlier in a conversation with Andy Shore was talking um, specifically from um, Mr. Lin's um, voice saying that our city has forgotten the Black community. I think from what we can see, um, with these different motions, with this different, these different committees coming on, that it's not our city deciding that, um, or it is that our city has actually decided to consciously um, go over and over police different black communities um, to abuse or even ignore our black leaders and ignore their demands. Um, just to uphold a type of status quo. When it comes to what we need for our community, our state, and our nation is to actively be fighting against police brutality, to actively be fighting against the different systems that actually uphold a system that disproportionately affects black and brown members of our community. Lansing has the opportunity to lead and when it comes down to it, those who can't quicken their pace, like you've got to step aside. This isn't the time for some type of slow bureaucratic motion and committees. There's national black leaders, researchers and community members inside of Lansing that can give you actionable items today, different things that we could do in Lansing today to actually benefit our black community. And as reflected, these opportunities have been missed in this past month. We have the opportunity to lead we have an opportunity as a city to lead in these kind of efforts but it seems like right now the pace is too slow for all of the black constituents who are still living in fear and distrust of the enforcers that we currently have in this administration i am a person who supports black lives matter i do align with their message to have andy shore resign and at that i do um Resign my time, whatever y'all say. Thank you. 
Thank you. And next we have Ross Fisher. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ross Fisher. Uh, I live at 909.5 Seymour. Um, tonight, I want to express my support uh, for the demands made by Black Lives Matter and by Paul Birdsong's group. Uh, Andy Shore must resign, and we have to defund our police department, uh, reinvesting that money into programs that actually improve people's lives uh, while rethinking how we do public safety. Um, the mayor's had a lot of chances to make changes in the past. Um, I was part of a group that uh, went to his office last summer, uh, demanded changes to policing in Lansing following uh, an incident of police brutality against a 16-year-old girl. Uh, Mayor Shore did not follow through on any of the demands made by the group. A year later, uh, Andy authorized the use of tear gas against protesters downtown. Um, and in response to demands for defunding, uh, he has offered up a measly $170,000 for a racial equity fund, which is nothing more uh, than a PR stunt. Um, in addition to the lack of leadership, uh, the mayor's office has had a troubled history of racial discrimination revealed. Um, I want to thank Michael Lynn Jr. and Erica Lynn for their work in bringing this history to light. Um, I would encourage everyone to check out um, their show, America 20 to Life. Um, listen to their interviews with Natasha Atkinson and Colin Boyce. Um, that's just the start. Um, their stories are truly disturbing, and they reveal a lack of respect for Black City employees. When Natasha Atkinson tried to help bridge the gap between Black Lives Matter and the mayor's office last year, she was told by Meryl Safford that the Black Lives Matter organization was like a dog without a bone. Colin Boyce uh, worked for the Bernero administration and discussed how the culture in the mayor's office changed in a dramatic fac uh, fashion during the uh, Shore administration. Uh, he felt completely ignored and disrespected and quit his position. Uh, this pattern of racial discrimination alone is cause for Andy Shore to resign. Uh, turning to council, uh, I urge all members to listen to the voices of those most affected by police brutality and to take bold actions. Uh, you can be leaders and you can be on the right side of history. Um, let's do the responsible thing and cut our bloated police budget and reimagine new ways of doing public safety here at Lansing. Uh, when you're deliberating in this process, I want you all to think about all the encounters that police have in, uh, with our citizens in Lansing. For the majority of those encounters, do we need a person with a gun and various other weapons to handle those situations? I think the answer in a number of those situations is absolutely not. And there are models across the world and in our own country that we can look to that present us with ways of addressing daily problems and keeping each other safe. Um, a better world is truly possible if we're brave enough to confront our current systems. Um, let's get to work and let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Erica Starr. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Erica Starr. Um, I've been a resident of the east side of Lansing for about three years now. Um, I'm commenting tonight specifically to voice support for Black Lives Matter and Black community leaders in our city. Uh, I'd like to echo their calls to defund the Lansing Police Department and for the resignation of Andy Shore as mayor. Um, I had kind of like a written response. I'm like a little bit anxious about it. But um, one thing I will say, I was born and raised in a small town in Northern Michigan uh, and I'm white and my parents both worked blue collar jobs. And I was taught that police were there to protect me. Um, and I'm sure that that's the case for people listening, uh, even some of the council members. Um, but I have come to learn, as I hope many of you are learning, uh, that the police are not a source of protection, um, especially for Black and Brown communities, um, as well as for uh, members of the LGBTQ community, um, where and we have a vibrant queer community in Lansing, and I think that that's really important to notice, too. Um, so my question, especially for Andy Shore, is what will it take? Uh, what will it take for you to commit to divesting from a violent institution that terrorizes black and brown communities? Uh, how many lives need to be taken by police or destroyed by the prison industrial complex? How many stories do you need to hear? 
how many names need to be written on protest signs or memorial murals painted in our public spaces? How can anyone be so desensitized to the scope and scale of this violence that you feel like a mere two, what, two tenths of a percent, two one hundredths of a percent? I can't remember how much 100,000 is out of 47 million. Uh, but how can you be so desensitized to feel like that's enough? That's not defunding. And most people in the community who have spoken tonight have expressed that that's insulting, really. And it is. Um, I sincerely hope that the city council listens to those of us who have commented tonight um, and recognizes their ability to be leaders in this moment. Um, Andy Shore, you had an opportunity. Uh, you repeatedly failed. I don't even know if you're listening right now. I hope you are. Um, but I hope you take this as a message that you really need to listen, actually listen, to listen, not to respond, not to argue, but actually listen. Step down. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Josh Levine. Hello? We can hear you. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. OK. Yeah. My name is Josh Levine. I live in the third ward in Moores River Estates. So while I'm speaking to all of council, I'm uh, particularly speaking to uh, Adam Hussein. Uh, because you're my councilman. Uh, and I do wanna point out I'm speaking as an individual, not representing anybody but myself, but I am here in solidarity with the uh, black activist leaders of Lansing, in particular Black Lives Matter Lansing and We the Free People of Lansing, uh, and their demands, uh, including defunding the police, reinvesting those monies in you know things that actually help the black community of Lansing and uh, the resignation of Andy Shore. I do think that uh, a lot of the, the more sheltered of us in this city uh, have, have some sense that Lansing is somehow different from the rest of the country in terms of, of policing, and it's not. I mean, you've got the tear gas from just a couple of weeks ago of protesters. You've got uh, police punching a teenage girl. You had uh, a so-called resource officer in Eastern, you know, uh, sexually abusing uh, a student a year or two ago. So this is, this is an inherently violent institution uh, and, and we have to do better uh, for everyone. Uh, $100,000, you know, uh, for the sake of, oh, and we'll shift it off to these other organizations outside of the city. No, that's not, you have to pull it. And I've heard that, you know, uh, oh, well, if we take anything from the budget, it will be for community relations or for training. How about uh, taking it from the contracts with uh, a company that supplies you tear gas, uh, which is, let me see here, the Michigan Police Equipment Company in Charlotte. How about taking it from overtime for officers uh, and things like that? And then what you can do, and just take as much as you can, reduce the police to the things that involve active major violence. San Francisco is now talking about having non-armed people uh, deal with non-crimes. I would say that minor nonviolent crimes or even minor violence should be dealt with by non-armed people. Because uh, this, is, this is not how we can go forward in this country and in this city. Uh, and Andy needs to resign. I saw him at the Black Lives uh, Matter uh, Zoom meeting uh, a few weeks ago. And his ignorance, his, his unwillingness was just astounding. And it broke my heart. It's like, you're the leader of the city, at least in theory. You should be willing to lead. Uh, well, there's some more stuff, but it looks like I'm running out of time. So all power to the people. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, we have Emily. Um, hi, sorry, I'm still trying to get my spell situated. Okay, hi, hi, um, I'm Emily Walkowski. I, you all know me. Uh, especially you, Andy Shore. I'm sure you remember last week when I reminded you just how vile and disgusting you are and just how ashamed of yourself you should be for absolutely failing to be there for your Black constituents, for once again tear gassing your constituents, for peacefully assembling. Um, you should be ashamed of yourself for offering $170,000 out of your $47 million police budget. It's embarrassing you're embarrassing you're an embarrassing mayor there are mayors all over this country who are doing the right thing 
in this situation, and you're not one of them. You're turning us into a joke. When when the black people of your city call to defund, you say, oh, sure, here's $100,000 out of our budget. It's a joke. You pulled that number out of your head. That You pulled that number out of thin air. And I'm fairly certain that you've told people that you pulled that number out of thin air. You don't care about this movement. This is not something that matters to you. This is not something that's on your priority list. This is simply a minor inconvenience for you. You're uncomfortable right now because there's so many people who are on this call yelling at you and telling you to quit your job. Good. You should feel uncomfortable. You make black people very uncomfortable. And until you, until you resign, we're going to continue making you feel uncomfortable. We're going to continue coming here every other week. I'm sure you remember the people who cared about cannabis. We were here every other week. That is a small issue compared to this issue. This is huge. This is a major movement. We're not going to stop. We're going to be here. It's, it's not going to stop. We'll be here every two weeks telling you to defund, telling you to quit your job, telling you to resign, because that's what we want. And as the mayor, you were elected to represent the people. And unfortunately, the people want you gone. And I want to be clear what it means to defund the police. We're not saying, okay, tomorrow, all the police, bye, good job, see you later. No, we're demanding that you take uh, your massively inflated police budget and put it towards the things that are actually going to make a difference in our community, that to meet the needs of the people who are committing crimes in order to meet their needs, we help them meet their needs so they don't have to commit crimes. It's simple humanity. And the fact that anybody on council is not outspokenly like for defunding the police and putting our money into the places that it should be going, you should be ashamed of yourself. Anybody who's not calling for defunding the police and siding with Black Lives Matter should be embarrassed. Andy, resign. City Council, defund the police. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Amanda Thomas Show. Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant III, Brianna Taylor, Khalif Browder, Darian Hunt, Troy Hodge, William Green, Ahmad Arbery, Dion Johnson, Tony McDade, Jamel Floyd, George Floyd, Rayshard Brooks, Talia Marie Kelly, David McTee, Chris Beatty, Sandra Bland, Sandra Bland, Sandra Bland, Sandra Bland. Given the history of policing and the most recent murders of black people, I'm asking you to redirect money away from Lansing Police Department in the 2021 budget and instead to prioritize services that help strengthen our communities. As members of City Council, it is your mission to ensure quality of life for the Lansing community. You have seen the damage police officers have done to the vibrancy, safety, health, and inclusivity of both our local and national communities. We can no longer deny that increased policing has limited both personal and economic opportunities for people who have already been historically marginalized, specifically Black people. To secure both short and long-term stability for our city, we need to better reallocate and manage our city resources. Defunding the police is a sustainable practice that will protect and enhance our culture as well as our national and historical resources. Under the guise of keeping the public safe, policing has been a well-funded form of oppression that continues violent cycles instead of ending them. Lansing re residents and businesses deserve to receive reliable, efficient, and quality services, as well as a feeling of safety. It is time to defund the police and move resources to programs and services that heal and build community. I want a budget that reflects our community's priorities and needs. In 2020, the city of Lansing's budget showed over 30% of the general fund was allocated to policing, while less than 10% was allocated to human services and public services combined. We want Lansing's police department funding redistributed to services that actually help the people of Lansing, including affordable housing, more mental health services, rent suspension and forgiveness for those who are currently unemployed, Beyond policing our community, these services are proven to be more effective in improving, in improving community safety and wellness. I demand a budget that supports community well-being rather than funding police forces that tear us apart. 
Please consider your role in enriching and empowering our communities, especially amidst systemic racial injustice, widespread illness, and econ economic vulnerability. And Andy Shore, seriously, just resign. Like, we, I know that I'm just gonna go ahead and say what everybody else has said, but it's pretty embarrassing at this point. Um, it's, I'm just embarrassed to be in Lansing and have you as my mayor, so please go. Thank you. Next, we have Leah Fitch. Leah? Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Leah Fitch. Um, I'm a resident of the First Ward. Uh, um, I would like to first review something from earlier in the meeting um, and register my disappointment in the vote to uh, fund that detective. Um, it just shows that whoever decided to spend that money without approval, just got approval to do that. And I, as a resident, would like to know who that was and if there's gonna be any kind of accountability for that. Um, and in general, would like to press the city council to use whatever power they have to force accountability in the various issues that are being raised in these meetings. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure you have some kind of power to enforce accountability. Uh, and that's a necessary thing along with the transparency that you've stated you're committed to. Um, I'd also like to, uh, the main reason for me coming here was to uh, support Black Lives Matter demands in Lansing for Andy Shore to resign. Uh, there's still been no satisfying response to uh, the violence that Andy Shore ordered on peaceful protesters and the subsequent um, deplorable behavior and communicating with leaders of this community. He's got to go. Um, other people who are in this meeting, maybe we can organize a recall um, if he's not willing to resign. The second demand to defund the police, uh, just addressing the suggestions that have, or the proposals that have come forth so far. Um, defunding the police isn't just about putting money into community programs. That's the third demand. It's about taking resources away from an institution that is designed to terrorize and keep black people down. Uh, and it's important that we stop supporting that. Um, and the third demand to take that money and reinvest it in communities. Many other people have, are more educated on these topics and have already spoken on them. Um, but I'm urging the council and whoever the next mayor is to work with the leaders in the community who have been speaking up um, to define what those alternatives are. Um, and council, please use your imaginations sitting through these meetings uh, and some of the topics that come up. Um, you know, parking fees are not a priority. They're not a public health emergency the way that racism has just been declared to be so. Uh, and I'd like to see that reflected in the actions of the council. So, thank you. Angela Waters Austin, we will follow you into the fire. <laughs> Love you. The next speaker is Daniel Arnold. Hello, my name is Daniel Arnold. I love the city of Lansing. It is time, it is important in our tense social climate to take time to listen to every voice. Time has proven that muffled speakers cannot be silenced forever because the people care. As the public cries out, I wanna raise awareness of one neglected voice, mental health consumers. They are frequently stigmatized and some struggle to get services they need. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I called CMH about a homeless man that desired rehab. CMH conducted a lengthy, difficult intake that the man braved his way through, but never followed up. Diverse people receive mental health services, and I believe we, Mayor Shore, need to hear their voices more. At the gun violence meeting at City Hall, you said, mental health is a huge problem. We are overwhelmed by mental health. You propose a new behavioral health center as if professionals are the only solution. Let me show you a better way. Give us a voice in your office. You need actual mental health consumers to share the perspectives without you, with you to eliminate this bias. We are not scary and tied to gun violence. 
We are diverse, misunderstood, and frequently high functioning. Do not give us just a new place to be treated by professionals. Give us your listening ear. Establish an advisory council actually composed of mental health consumers. I'm on disability, but my life is not over. I call dispatch to help people in need and communicate regularly with law enforcement. I ask Mayor Shore that you meet with mental health consumers once a month for at least an hour. Let us share with you our wonderful talents and about programs like Justice and Mental Health, Charter House, National Alliance of Mental Illness, and Peer Support. Mayor Shore, we are not scary. Talk to us. Thank you. Next is Tejmika Torak. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, Tajmika Torek again, Executive Director of the Firefucker Foundation. The first thing I want to say is thank you to Patricia Spitzley and Jeremy Garza and Brandon Betts. I've had some really generative conversations um, with Jeremy and Brandon and Patricia. I look forward to meeting you tomorrow and I thank you for your curiosity um, around what it means to defund the police. Um, and I extend that offer to anybody else on the city council. I wanted to share a couple of things because I know what's going to happen when people hear about defunding the police. They're instantly going to say, don't do that. And they're going to use survivors like me as an example as why it's not possible. So I think the first thing that I wanna say is that we uh, know that every five days an officer is accused of sexual misconduct. And half of those officer arrests for sexual misconduct are for incidents involving minors. We also know that though records of police misconduct are not often made public, research into those records uncovered 3,145 allegations of rape, child molestation, and other sexual misconduct, and 2,307 cases of domestic violence by officers over the last decade. We know that police are a part of the sexual and domestic violence problem, and so we cannot claim that, that, that survivors are the reasons why we cannot defund the police. We also know that after, out of 1,000 sexual assaults, only 4.6% of rapists will ever be incarcerated. Police do not keep survivors safe. The people who keep survivors safe are survivors. That's important for everyone to understand. We disclose, we come together, we protect one another, and we find resources in a community that invests 30% of their money in the police and not in the resources that we need to heal. That's important for you to know. I also want people to know that um, if there is, if, if Lansing is anything like the 10 police departments across the country that were in the New York Times article that I shared today, 1% of their service calls were serious incidents of violence. And I would call on Police Chief Green to be transparent about those 300 calls a day. If you have an issue with the fireworks going off every night, I want you to know that you can call 502 595 2300 and ask them to arrest Brett Hankinson, Jonathan Mattingly, and Miles Cosgrove for killing Breonna Taylor in her bed. We know we can save millions of dollars just because of the empty jails right now due to COVID. We have a roadmap for budget transformation. We can defund the police, give the community what it needs, and it will be safe, healed, and whole. And we can do all of that as soon as Andy Shores resigns. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Next, we have April Pooley. <laughs> Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello? Let's move on and if we can get April back, we'll try. Okay, uh, Erica Spadden. Hello, this is Erica Spitzbaden. I have lived in and around Lansing since 1978. I currently work for the Board of Water and Light. I will live in Lansing again in August. I am, I am here to, to ask the mayor to step down. 
I, I really thought that this was a situation that the mayor could correct, but I just do not think that he has the leadership skills. The, the incident that happened in Lansing on Friday night as the Black Lives Matter was being painted is a prime example of why we really do not actually need police. What happened there, the harassers continued to harass without police protecting the people who were painting. The community were the first responders when the person was hit by the motorcycle. The community provided first aid. The community blocked off the roads. The community took photographs of the motorcyclists. The community identified some of the motorcyclists. Sure, the police have been somewhat involved, but this was handled by the community. And the police didn't prevent it. They actually did not show up until later and blocked off the road after things were already under control. And so when we talk about defunding the police, this is a great example that happened in our city. It happened recently. It's very, very simple. The community came together and took care of a situation because that's the type of thing that the police cannot prevent. And folks have been coming to the Lansing City Council for a very long time. Mayor Shore is not the first mayor to hear from Black Lives Matter. They're asking for the same thing that they've been asking for for a very long time, and the city is just not listening. And that's really what I'm demanding. I don't have the answers, but folks from the community, from Black Lives Matter, other folks from the black community are bringing the information to the city. Very clear plans, very clear policies, ways that this can work. I mean, a $47 million budget, how many people could you feed with that? How many people could you house? People don't commit crimes because they want to, they commit them because they need a place to live, they need food, they need protection. And the police don't provide those things at all. If we could find ways to meet those needs with those funds, we would be able to do away with the police department or at least significantly reduce it and save so much and help so many. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Zoe and I can't see the rest of the last name. Zoe Steinfield. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, um, I don't have anything written. Um, I'm speaking as an individual, um, I'm addressing in particular Mayor Shore. Um, so I, I'm a, I was born in Lansing and I live in Lansing, I work in Lansing. And uh, Mayor Shore, I, um, we don't know each other well, but we go to the same synagogue and um, I, I wasn't just excited when you were elected because you were a, you know, more liberal than your opponent. Um, I was excited to, for the first, uh, to my knowledge, the first Jewish mayor of Lansing. I think probably a lot of people here might not fully appreciate what that means, but I know that that's significant. And I, it's another reason that I am just so disappointed and embarrassed um, at the way that you are responding to this moment. I, I don't know what being Jewish means to you, but I know that um, it, it means that you pursue justice. I know that it means that you repair the world, meaning you fix unjust laws wherever they are. I know that it means that you love your neighbor and uh, treat them the way that you want to be treated. And the, I know that being Jewish, the history of persecution and oppression is, is baked into our history, baked into our tradition. And that you could just look away at oppression happening to our neighbors under your watch. It is unconscionable. And I, I, have, I have no words really. Um, people are telling you what they need. The police, when they, when they function in the, in the best possible way they can, um, even, even when they aren't acting brutally, which we know they are, they're, they're a band-aid. They're an afterthought to what should be happening. 
which is people need services. People need their basic needs met. People need childcare. People need mentorship for their, for their youth. People need healthcare. People need mental health care. Schools funded. There are so, there's a million ways that you could make things better for people. And instead you're over-policing them, terrorizing them. Why? It's so obvious. And it's just, it's not who we are. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Tiffany Lemieux McKissick. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so good evening, members of the city council and Mayor Shore. Um, I moved to Lansing 18 years ago from Flint and myself and my ex-husband, Marcus McKissick, have been really active in this community since then. And the thing about it is that I, I've i been there. Um, you know, I was there, Andy, when you were elected and the hope and the excitement from myself and my peers and other members of this community, you know, I witnessed that. I witnessed, um, you know, a sense of belief that we, we had found a champion. Um, I interacted with you in the legislature when I worked for the Community Economic Development Association of Michigan. And, you know, we really felt like it was gonna be a time where uh, marginalized people had a voice. Um, and I have to tell you that I've been there through all of this firsthand and I can't express how many of my good personal friends that I've had to console as a result of your administration. Actually, I am gonna tell you. Um, so the thing is, is that I was there when Mike Lynn experienced racial intimidation and harassment in the fire department and he spoke up and I, and I think, I hope you appreciate the amount of courage and fortitude that, that took and you never talked to him. Instead, your office sent out a press release that said, we're confident the fire department will be exonerated, but you, you never heard his perspective. You never understood his pain. As a matter of fact, I think that is, is the underlying issue is that one of them is that we've never seen empathy or understanding about these things. I was also there um, when Black Lives Matter and One Love Global, Angela Waters Austin, as well as Mike Lynn and other members of the community went to City Hall to have a discussion about the treatment of the 16 year old teenager that was most definitely, undeniably the victim of excessive force by LPD. You had an opportunity to say, you know what, I hear you, I see your pain, this is inappropriate, we're gonna address it. We heard none of that. I was there firsthand, I saw that, I witnessed that, I felt that. The letters that were sent by the community were completely dismissed. Um, I was also there when the protesters downtown for the first protest were peaceful protesters. And yes, there was things happening two blocks away in Washington, um, but the people at the Capitol had no warning, um, no opportunity to move, and they were definitely tear gassed um, or pepper sprayed or whatever it was, but they were literally peaceful and there was, and there was no warning and there was no humanity. Um, I was also Thank there. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next we have Ashleya Fenishi. Hi, my name is Ashley Fennessy. And I'm here to ask that we defund the police and invest in community and prevention rather than more policing, and trying to punish our way out of community problems. I didn't grow up in Lansing, but I moved here about five years ago and I absolutely fell in love with this city. And I love a lot of aspects, our parks, but most of all, I love the people in the community that we have here. It's not for those of you who maybe have lived your whole life here it's not always like this in other towns i've lived in there's a real sense of community connection that's palpable we take care of our neighbors we check in on our neighbors we get involved the number of grassroots organizations here from the firecracker foundation to the city mission to punks with lunch to there's so many people taking direct action to take care of our people 
And it's been jarring to see that our city budget doesn't at all reflect those values that I see in our neighbors when we're spending a third of our money trying to um, police and enforce rules and punish people and are making a lot of our community members feel unsafe for good reason. Um, it's time that our budget reflects our values of community investment, community care, and start solving root problems and preventing harm instead of trying to just punish people out of causing any harm. We, I've been really disappointed to see um, a lot of our leaders acting really defensively and acting, um, trying to quell dissent and put out um, band-aid solutions instead of taking this as a serious concern and a serious conflict in our community values that has really been raised to a head. Um, I want our leaders to be excited about the possibilities and how we could lead the way in transforming our community and addressing social problems differently. We have an amazing research and just research and public policy institution around the corner. We have incredible black community leaders. We have more grassroots community organizations than I can count. And most of all, we have citizens who have displayed over and over again that they want to take care of their neighbors and not punish them. So I would urge leaders to please, as you're considering moving forward, to um, be excited about the possibilities and listen and being happy to learn and not so defensive and um, ultimately make real commitments to defund the police and reinvest in our community. Okay, thank you. And next we have Connor M. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. So um, first of all, I want to start out by saying that I support the demands of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter Lansing and other groups in the area that are advocating for change in the city of Lansing. Um, I'd especially like to echo the statement of uh, Tashmika Torak tonight and also bring attention to the fact that the police do not do a good job in general of enforcing issues of racialized intimidation in this country. And I don't think Lansing is any different. And so um, that that is a big thing for me specifically for defunding the police because this represents a serious issue where the police are given resources to handle crimes in our city and are utterly ineffective at dealing with these types of crimes. Now, um, I know this is not a county commission meeting, but I wanna say to all of you on the council and Clerk Swope and <laughs> President Spadafor, all of you, I would like to see you use your influence to really make a difference when it comes to the way that we deal with jailing and imprisoning people of color in our state. We have a severe issue where our communities are over-policed by the Lansing Police Department and many others. We have people of color who are over-convicted, over-sentenced after they've been over-arrested by the police. And right now, to be sent to jail for any, any crime could be a death sentence in the era of the coronavirus. And I just wanna say that this, this threatens the health of the community. These cases aren't just gonna stay in jail. They're going to, they could potentially threaten anyone in the community. And if we are truly serious about declaring racism as a public health crisis, we need to recognize that jails are not closed systems and they can actually influence the outside world and our health. So this is something that I would like to see the council act upon right away. This is something that the council could declare a resolution 
to the state of Michigan, to the Michigan State Legislature to act now because we need to address this now before this crisis gets any worse. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And we have um, April Pooley. We had a technical issue earlier, so uh, go ahead, April. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is April Pooley. I'm here as a Lansing resident to support calls to defund the Lansing City Police and redistribute much more than an insulting $100,000 of that funding to initiatives that actually keep the community safe and prevent violence. It's not enough to throw your leftover budget pocket change at a so-called anti-racism fund. You need to thoroughly defund the Lansing City Police because the only thing that will make the police less violent is to make them less powerful, which includes dramatically reducing their funding and their duties and responsibilities. So it's not just about investing more money in community resources, that money needs to come out of the police budget in a way that reduces the power of the police. And you need to listen to the black leaders in our community for guidance on how to allocate those redistributed funds in ways that will benefit the communities, neighborhoods, and schools that are most over-policed and targeted by police oppression. It's clear that Andy Shore is not capable of listening to or respecting his black constituents. So I echo the calls for Mayor Shore's resignation as a necessary measure to keep Lansing safe and anti-racist. And I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Ryan Smith. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? You guys there? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. I want to first of all start off by saying you guys look pretty good. Uh, uh, you guys uh, seem to endure the COVID situation pretty well. I'm, I'm jealous. Hence, my video is turned off tonight. Uh, the reason why I wanted to wait to speak to you guys tonight is I did have concerns about that police commissioners meeting that, that, that are slated. Uh, I know from a logistical standpoint, limiting the amount of participation in terms of time might seem like a good idea. But when you hear the way that the public is concerned in terms of transparency and accountability, I think we have to be looking at every avenue that we can to get the public involved, to get the public to feel like they're being listened to. and it needs to be done. It really needs to be done. I'm, I'm glad to see all the people participating tonight. We've had about an hour's worth of, of public comment, which I think is great. But when those meetings do happen over the next of the, uh, the next couple of weeks, please make sure that all, every person who wants to speak, every person who wants to contribute is able to do so. Okay, good luck to all of you guys. Have a good night. Thank you. The clerk appears to have frozen, but I would uh, point out that Samuel Klon, you are our next and final speaker, and your three minutes begin now. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to address Andy Shore. He's done, and he's clinging to something that's not reality. My call is to the rest of council now. What will you do? And Mike, Mike Lynn is one of my role models, whether he knows it or not. He inspires me. You know, what do I want to be as I grow up, as I become a leader in Lansing, as I help people, as I protect my community, as I stand up to police? And I think he's right when he says, we don't have the currency to hate Andy. There are more important things that everyone else in this room is doing for people in Lansing. And, and the majority of people in this city are of the same mind. We need Lansing to be better and to do better. And we need leadership that isn't standing in the way for the sake of pride. And all that means is that we need to remove Andy and anyone on council who's actively defending him. Every day you waste every hour of your time that is spent on this issue is a detriment to the people of Lansing. We could be talking about anything else and spending on anything else. And I know this and I think that you do too. We could petition him during a pandemic according to our charter and we will, but I would ask you to not force us to do this. Not because of the effort that we are willing to take, but because there's a global pandemic and we don't wanna to have to go door to door. We need a le leader willing to embrace change. Lansing can be one of a few national catalysts. When JFK said, change is the law of life and those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. Andy is the past. Tear gassing citizens without warning, proper procedure, unlawful assembly declarations, that is the past. 
The future is a city where we have crisis intervention workers. We have more social workers, educators, community medics, and all of those millions invested into resources that are preventative, that are a remedy. So in this present, what will you do as city council? How will you stall these people? Or how will you embrace a Lansing that is safer and more cared for? How will you govern this city on the terms of the people as we are all speaking to you repeatedly or on the structures that we see crumbling around us across the nation? It's reflective of your characters as officials if you don't act on what you're hearing. And I will as honestly as possible reiterate exactly what people are saying in my own words that Andy Shore is an arrogant bastard and he needs to leave. I cede my time. That concludes our public comment for the evening. Um, the clerk just texts, oh no, he's back, Mr. Swope, if you wanna.